I have a bit of a history discussing Monster Hunter World. Early into making my history series, around when I was going to talk about Generation 5 specifically, I wrote an opinion piece about World and how the changes made to Generation 5 helped to bring more people into the series, but also seemed to remove a level of charm or familiarity from Monster Hunter as a whole that I ultimately missed. Changes that led to a good game overall, a great game even, but ones that I felt strayed far from what helped define Monster Hunter as a series in comparison to other games with within its genre. And the video got an understandable amount of criticism and backlash. There were those that supported and those that didn't. Those who didn't agree with me were particularly agitated with my stance on the series, and I believe there's multiple factors for this. For one, World is one of the best-selling games in the series. Many people look at its ability to sell copies and bring in millions of new players as a de facto reason for it to be one of the best games overall. A true future in terms of direction the design of the series should take. Others often feel that they are looked at as new players to the series for starting in World and can feel defensive when these newer entries not only get criticized but compared to older entries as well. That's due partially to a culture of gatekeeping we can see online when older players may look with disdain on the newer generation. Too many times have I seen people online say something along the lines of I hate fifth fleeters, a term used to describe players who started in generation 5. There's sometimes a certain level of privilege people will feel for being a considered veteran of the series, starting further back in the series' lifetime than the newer players who hopped on when the game really began to get popularized. That's never been my personal intention. While I have had many criticisms for some of the changes made within Generation 5, never have I felt a level of disdain towards the player base that was introduced thanks to World and its success. I instead try to promote the older games to the new player base rather than seeing these fresh players disappear entirely. I think a fresh set of eyes and a popularization of a series is ultimately a good thing to have, but I believe we can have these things while still retaining many characteristics of old school Monster Hunter. When you simply try to say that an older game is better, it's going to be met with a lot of resistance, especially from the players that enjoy the newer game as that's what introduced them into the series, and since they're the majority and often attacked for being new to the series, chances are that criticizing a game like World is going to lead to the vocal majority of commenters being those who want to defend the game overall. That doesn't mean the entire reception of the video was negative. I still had plenty of comments from players who agreed with me and missed what old school had to offer. Newer players who had tried the older games and preferred them over Generation 5. I even have older players who actually couldn't go back after World. Opinions are varied, and as I pointed out in my previous video, our biases are a core part of this, and I try to use my bias to convey what I think is important within the series for me so other people can relate to it if they feel the same way. A means of giving players who agree with me a way of expressing their concern with the series' progression, or to shed some light on my outlook for players who had never thought about it before. I was accused of creating clickbait, accused of not being objective, accused of being blinded by nostalgia, and much more, but the simple fact remains that I still to this day prefer playing older entries within the series over the newer ones, and that's something I tried to convey in my original piece, albeit, you know, self-admittedly, not very well. Not, not the best video I ever made. I have much more to say on World as a whole in comparison to the past entries, and not all of my opinions from the original video hold up today. That's thanks to having all these games fairly fresh in my mind, and also thanks to recently playing through the entirety of World with a weapon I wasn't familiar with. I recently played Freedom Unite and made a retrospective about that entry. I did the same for 3 Ultimate as well. Now, having completed all I set out to do in Monster Hunter World, it felt right to revisit my thoughts on Generation 5 with World and Iceborne specifically, and better flesh out how I feel about the base game and Master Rank expansion overall. So today I'd like to take a look back at Monster Hunter World and Iceborne, seeing what this entry did right and wrong, while exploring how these choices will have a rippling effect throughout the future of the series. An addition that has left a line in the sand between some of the older players and some of the newer ones, a line I'd like to see players overall more willing to cross from either direction, and give all entries a try with an open mind. 
mind. Like the previous retrospectives on Freedom Unite and 3 Ultimate, this will not be a historical look back on the features of the series and more a personal look back on World and Iceborne as a whole while comparing it to some of the older entries I covered already as well as Monster Hunter Rise. It'd be difficult to talk about what World and Iceborne did right or wrong without comparing it to earlier and later entries that are now night and day comparisons between one another. That being said, I was honestly shocked with how much fun I had with some of the later content in Iceborne specifically, as I didn't spend too much time within the late game originally outside of what I had to to get some of the better gear. If you enjoy these videos, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing. It really helps and allows me to keep making this content for you all. With that out of the way, I'm Super Rad, and you're watching the Monster Hunter World and Iceborne Retrospective. Once you board this ship, there's no turning back. The next ground your feet will touch will be that of the new world. To talk about Monster Hunter World, you have to talk about the massive design shifts between it and previous entries in the series. It'd be disingenuous to not point out how crucially different World is in many ways, and there's a lot to discuss on that topic that will be brought up throughout the entirety of this video. But I'd like to first focus on the core development and design direction the team had planned for this entry prior to its release and what that meant going forward once the game was finally out. Monster Hunter World was a big step for the development team at Capcom, and Ryozo Sujimoto specifically. It was to take the concept of Monster Hunter and expand upon it in ways that the team felt were impossible to do with the hardware that had been provided to them previously. New generations of consoles and stronger computers meant that more was possible overall and the developers wanted to capitalize on that. This isn't necessarily new to Capcom, as large franchises within their arsenal get older, the developers of these games often look at ways to break the mold and create something within the title of a specific series while making it an altogether new and fresh experience. We saw this done particularly effectively with the evolution of the Resident Evil series. Resident Evil 4 was a departure from a lot of the survival aspects we had seen previously, instead choosing to focus on a more action-oriented approach while keeping staple concepts like inventory management and rigid gun controls. Resident Evil 7 was another huge departure from what players were used to from the series, opting to create a first-person horror experience while still having staple mechanics that made it aggressively Resident Evil. These were mostly to the benefit of the series and Capcom as a whole. Breaking out of their box allowed Capcom to not only provide a fresh experience to players, but some of the best experiences the series has ever seen, and many people would say it's the same with Monster Hunter World now. And as I've mentioned previously, we've seen this success in the form of sales and how much money World has generated, as well as how many new players have been brought into the series as a whole. So Monster Hunter was no different than to Resident Evil. The team wanted to create something new, but keep the feeling of Monster Hunter within it, and for the most part, they succeeded at doing so. Suji Moto, for example, mentioned in an interview for The Verge in 2017 that he was tired of the isolation created through the old school game zoning mechanics with every major area on the map being sectioned off. He wanted to create a more living world with its own ecology, one that the player could explore freely and openly and the newer generation of gaming hardware was going to make that possible. However, creating this one change essentially led to a huge swath of changes being necessary overall to make the gameplay function function properly within an entry that didn't have zones. Players now had no way of switching between zones in order to escape a monster, meaning that new means of recurring mechanics had to be developed. Players gained access to the Gilly Mantle and Tall Shrubbery, which would allow them to hide from a monster's vision. They also gained the ability to drink and eat while on the move, as standing still didn't make as much sense to them within this new environment. Giving players this advantage meant that they had to make drinking potions a longer overall to help balance it out. This thought process had to be a applied to every recurring mechanic within the series as the entire fundamental balance of the game was going to have to change around this new mechanical setting. I've seen a lot of people point to this Verge interview specifically as a means of arguing for the changes, usually under the concept of developer intent or developer vision. Many seem to believe that World is what the developers had always wanted to be able to do, and criticizing some of the changes within means that you are criticizing the game based on what the developer wanted out of it. I don't think that's 
fully necessarily true, however. There's a certain amount of charm and style in the game with all of these mechanics within the series. Survival mechanics, methodical mechanics, certain limitations that make you play in a different way within Generation 1-4 to 4 than you do now. While it was the developer's intent to try something new within Generation 5, I find it hard to believe that for four generations, developers and designers were shaking their heads wishing they could change all of the mechanics to fit within an open world environment. Rather, it makes more sense that World was to be a paradigm shift within the series to see what they could do with the new hardware, and the concepts that Ryozo described in that interview were in hindsight comparing what he wanted to do then to what he wants to do now. So yes, it was the developer's intent to make Generation 5 open and zoneless, but this wasn't them finally escaping from the confines of the old school limitations. And so you can then ask yourself, was this change in intent the right call? Should Ryozo have tried to simply expand on the older mechanics, or was this new direction the right way to go? Sales would say yes, some players would say no, and we'll look at how those changes affected the gameplay overall, especially in terms of world as a live service entry. So many things had to be considered for this change that sounded simple at the time. How would monsters work in this new environment? How would items work? How would the player interact with it? So many factors were based around this change that it began to shape the Monster Hunter series into something that it wasn't previously. And before you start commenting about me complaining about this, I'm not. But we have to state and address that this is the case for better or worse. World is very different from previous entries, it's just a fact. Whether it's good or bad is based on your own opinions and biases. And as I pointed out, that wasn't the only change that was affecting things. World was developed to be an online live service and that in turn had various effects on the gameplay and events to name a few. MT Framework, the engine that Monster Hunter was being developed within for the majority of its lifespan, was also experiencing its own limitations with these changes. A notorious tech demo for World included Legaia crews fighting against an Anginath, but Leviathans overall were scrapped due to various skeleton issues with the new environments and system, only for them to come back and rise on the newer RE engine Capcom created for next generation entries like Resident Evil and Devil May Cry. Now before we move on, I just want to point out that while it's not a major feature in the grand scheme of things, the game was almost without the iconic Poogie pet. Something that was removed in Rise unfortunately and was almost removed in World as well. Poogie was actually added in a day one patch, I can only assume due to fan backlash, but I've never found an interview confirming this. Needless to say, this was for the betterment of the game overall. Now that we have a basis of understanding in terms of what the developers were wanting to bring within this entry, and an idea of how drastically it could affect various staple mechanics mechanics, we can now start to break down the various features of the game, discuss their pros and cons, as well as how they were affected overall with this jump to next gen. Let's start with Astera. Amazing, ain't it? Just look at this gate. It's like nature meant for us to build Astera right here. Astera has to be one of the weakest aspects of world overall. I feel like that's a pretty loaded statement to start off with, but I truly detest this hub over any other in the series, and it's not necessarily Astera's fault, but the fault of hardware limitations and design choices. Compare Astera to Kimura Village and Rise, for example. Both are fairly large explorable hubs, but Kimura Village has the added benefit of having fast travel available to the player regardless of where they are in the village. While Astera not only forces you to walk through the hub area to the elevator, but also wait for ungodly loading times that were only remedied through its release on PC later on and maybe like the current generation of consoles. The amount of time you spent waiting for a loading screen while fast traveling through Astera was more than if you simply walked to your destination to begin with. Astera is a perfect example of the developers tipping the scale between Monster Hunter's design philosophies. On one side, you have the arcadey action action and replayability we expect from a Monster Hunter entry. On the other side, you have aspects of RPGs and explorability. These have always been aspects of every entry, but with World's new design shift towards open, organic environments and next generation graphics, there seemed to be more focus on the immersion factor and overall explorability over the arcade style game loop we were used to, and this was to the game's detriment overall. Astera didn't need to be so large, but the developers wanted to make some 
something large and grandiose that would help sell to the player that they were playing a large next generation game. A game where the players could explore not only the depth of every map, but the hub area itself. But it was just too much, too large making running from location to location a chore, and too unoptimized to allow for the fast travel mechanic to be worthwhile. Astera stands as a testament of too much of a good thing, and would later be remedied in the Iceborne expansion with Celiana. It's the perfect, uh, Icarus example. But before we talk about Celiana, it's good to at least touch on what Astera had to offer and introduce to the player, and there was a fair bit. Just like other entries in the series, Monster Hunter World had some version of farm introduced. This version was very similar to that scene in 3 Ultimate, where the player could select items to duplicate and cultivate. I've talked in depth about this style versus the older style in both the Freedom Unite retrospective and the 3 Ultimate one, so I won't touch on it too much here, but for a game so focused on immersion, I was surprised that this staple mechanic was little more than a menu system in a game that wanted so desperately to feel alive. World would have been the perfect opportunity to bring back some version of the old farm system and make this aspect of the game feel more alive than it ever has previously, but they instead opted on a system that offered little to the player overall in terms of immersion. I've mentioned previously that I prefer this this system mechanically, I think it fits better overall with the old school game loop, but for a game attempting to break the mold, it was very surprising and disappointing to see them not attempt to reinvent the wheel here, or at least revisit a past iteration's mechanics that would have fit the aesthetic of world better. Another key mechanic within Astera is the melding pot, a returning mechanic from previous generation 4 entries that have been reworked and expanded upon. Originally, the melding pot was designed to allow players to sacrifice their unused talismans in order to randomly generate new ones. The cost of doing so was often more talismans than you would receive and was a means of removing removing excess talismans that the player would never use. It gave bad talismans a use rather than being sold off by the player hunter for Zenny and allowed a more streamlined approach to charm farming while continuing the RNG aspect we saw show up when charms were introduced in Generation 3. But the Elder Melder and Melding Pot in World is almost entirely different, and one major reason for this is due to how charms and decorations have switched roles slightly. Charms are now craftable and decorations are randomly generated, leading to more consistent charm buffs, but often leaving the player scratching their head trying to figure out what they're going to fit into their various slots. It's important to have a good idea of charms versus decorations within World compared to the rest of the series. Originally charms were the RNG mechanic and decorations could be crafted. Charms relied on tables, pre-made options that could be randomly awarded to the player based on which table they were in and, at the time, luck. Now we have craftable and upgradable charms, but decorations are the random element, often being generated as a reward after a quest or awarded through various other means like the melding pot. You end up having to ask yourself which is the better scenario here. Is it better to craft charms and receive decorations randomly, or is it better to craft decorations and receive charms randomly? This isn't simply a mechanic of the past either. Rise was quick to switch back to charm generation and decoration crafting, which was more in line with the previous entries, causing World to be the outlier. And that was definitely for the best in my opinion. The thing about charms is that they could be used as a bonus or base to help you form whichever set you were planning on making. They could come with bonus skill points and even additional slots. They were a way to free up some of the requirements for hunters to maximize their gains while not having it be necessary to have the perfect charm or a god charm. On top of this, you only needed to get a decent charm one time, meaning once you had it, the only other aspect of your set was through traditional crafting methods that Monster Hunter was built on. World falters here by making charms craftable, but choosing to make decorations RNG. And the biggest issue here is how much unrewarded grinding is necessary in order to get the decorations you need. If you need that ever elusive attack decoration, there's a good chance you may never see it within the casual playthrough, or even hours of endgame grinding. And what if your set requires you to have at least three of them? You could find yourself out of luck for an exorbitant amount of time, and any rare 
decoration is subject to this. It makes the game less about hunting monsters for their materials and more about killing monsters as fast as possible for the off chance that you could get one of the hundreds of decorations in the game, only for you to have to repeat the process for every other decoration until you finish that set. This was clearly something the developers were aware of too. Not only would they offer rare decorations as login bonuses from time to time in Iceborne, the game doesn't feel like certain aspects of maximization are even necessary until near the very end of Iceborne's lifetime or maybe within some of the challenging event quests at the end of Base World. Even Fatalis, considered to be one of the hardest fights in Iceborne, doesn't actually need you to be rocking a full-on endgame set with maximized damage. There's a lot of wiggle room in the world, so there's more freedom with what kinds of decorations you can slot in without making fights feel, you know, impossible. You don't need an attack boost necessarily, but you should slot something in, and the new alpha and beta set system helps with that as well. So decorations aren't a game breaker in world, but they are an annoyance in comparison to when charms were the RNG mechanic. I personally prefer farming charms over farming decorations, but I know some players within the community who do not appreciate either. Monster Hunter's strongest aspect is its game loop of collecting monster materials to turn into something that will give you a greater advantage on your next run. The player gets stronger by defeating monsters and getting their parts, and those parts were the core RNG element of Monster Hunter and continue to be, so why are charms or decorations for that matter RNG at all? I think World actually solved half of this problem by making charms craftable. Charms are great for giving the player a large bonus and having them be craftable like any other piece of equipment helps them feel more in line with what makes Monster Hunter's game loop so satisfying. They're even upgradable, so crafting a charm doesn't necessarily mean you're one and done. You can choose to grind and make your charm even better, something you can't necessarily do with decorations. And that's really good for the overall design of the game. So here's my fix. Instead of choosing between one or the other, have both charms and decorations be craftable. Have players be able to craft the decorations they need to fill in their various slots, thus providing an easy means for players to play around with the customizability aspect of the game, but also allow players to craft and upgrade charms. This removes a huge amount of secondary RNG, while keeping the core RNG element intact. Players can choose which charms they want to focus on and upgrade while crafting decorations to change up their sets as they progress or look to optimize. So moving back onto the melding pot, it's important to make it clear that these mechanics have switched and thus too did the melder need to be reworked. Instead of sacrificing for new charms, players can now sacrifice for decorations, but not randomly. Instead, players received a very limited selection of decorations that ranged from very weak to only okay, and could sacrifice various other decorations as well as paying a resource point fee in order to craft them. There's many other ways to generate random decorations through here as well. For example, later on the player gets access to Guild Alchemy, which allows them to use different tiers of tickets to produce random charms of various levels, similar to a gacha or a loot box. It's great. The better the ticket, the higher level of decoration you could receive, and I specifically mean rarity level, as low rarity decorations come in a variety of slot sizes. Where the Melder has really changed, however, is not within the decoration farming, but in the ability to generate pretty much any useful consumable in the game with ease. Max potions, ancient potions, mega demon drugs, traps, and even more. Even rare monster drops like gems and mantles are now obtainable if you have the right materials some of which can be gained guaranteed weekly. Most generic consumables will simply require a certain point's worth of monster parts in order to generate, and there's plenty of reward tickets and items that stack up in your inventory just for logging in that can be used towards this, meaning it will be a rare occurrence for you to ever find yourself low on any of the rarer consumable items. Monster mantles and gems on the other hand require specific tickets that can only be obtained through RNG via specific mechanics like the Steamworks or through completing the weekly limited bounties. How you feel about that is really, you know, up to you, to how you perceive your time in the game. When I replayed World recently, I wanted to get through it as fast as possible, using dedicated sets I farmed for specifically, meaning I had a lot of leftover materials that were never going to be used. This gave those materials a use rather than being sold, and cut down the amount of time I needed to farm for various items to make sure my inventory was stocked up in between every quest. Although it is hardly necessary to optimize your item sets until the very end of Iceborne, even then it's kind of optional. It also allowed me to cut down on the amount of monsters 
monster farming I needed to do in order to get a gem. If I randomly gained a celestial wyvern print from the steamworks, I no longer needed to farm a specific monster for their mantle. That could have been one or many more rejang attempts that I was able to cut out before even attempting him. So in that mindset of wanting to be done with the world as fast as possible, the melting pot was a great success. It allowed me to cut out as much time as I could as long as I had a bunch of trash materials to do so. But for people that are playing this game for the first time, or players that want to experience everything at a steady pace, does it make sense to have the melder, and does it really make that much of a difference overall? The same could be said about defender weapons and guardian armor which we will go into detail about later, but right now you kind of have to ask, is the heart of Monster Hunter's game loop affected negatively by the melder, and I would say that it is is through the inclusion of making rare monster materials craftable. Everything else is kind of fine. A lot of these rare consumables that you can craft could very well just be generated at the farm. In that sense, the melder and the farm are almost identical in mechanics, but one thing that the farm can't do is award you monster parts, something that is given to the player through the core gameplay loop of World. This ties into World being essentially a live service game. It was designed around being an online experience and encouraged players to log in every day, to complete their dailies and weeklies and get rewards in the process. What better reward is there for a hunter than one of the rarest drops in the game? This mechanic isn't necessarily new either. Monster Hunter Generation 4, for example, had the ability to duplicate items, but the duplication process required one of the items to already be in your inventory, and a specific item known as a Frenzy Shard to be used as the cost. You were much more limited in your options in terms of generating items. I think the Melder overall needed to be changed to help facilitate decorations due to how exorbitant the RNG surrounding them was, but I don't believe it was at all necessary to allow players to meld items to the level they could in World specifically, or the ability to meld rare monster parts. I think the portable team also knew this as we saw talisman melding revert to what it had been in previous entries, allowing players to generate random talismans with old unused ones and through monster parts. One final aspect of the melding pot that I don't have much to say about is the guiding alchemy option, which is used within the endgame guiding lands area of Iceborne, that we're going to talk about later on. This allows the player to spend gathered materials from the Guiding Lands in order to generate tracks that can spawn specific monsters in the land. While I have utilized the Guiding Lands in the past, I hardly ever saw myself using this feature specifically. It fits within the general concept of the Guiding Lands, but there's a lot to talk about there for later. I briefly mentioned bounties and investigations when talking about weekly rewards in Monster Hunter World. These were ways to help challenge the player into completing various tasks they may not normally consider during their game time experience as well as giving them a means to come back at least every week in order to reap the rewards. Bounties are broken up into three categories. Normal bounties can be registered by the player and completed fairly easily. They can range from gathering specific items to defeating certain monsters or hunting on certain maps. Their main reward is armor spheres and research points, which the player can use for upgrading and around various facilities. Critical bounties are more specific tasks that you can't choose from, usually unlocked by talking to NPCs and give rewards like wyvern prints, which can then be used for items or monster materials. Limited bounties are the weeklies I mentioned earlier. Each offer their own set of rewards, but once all are completed within the week, the player can gain a gold or celestial wyvern print depending on which version of the game they were playing at the time. It was gold in base world and then I think celestial and iceborne. I don't know if you ever get gold and iceborne or not. I feel like it should be no surprise that I simply loathe the live service aspect of this game. It just added too much bloat to the mechanics of a game that was simplistic at first glance but full of depth as you got further in. Too often do I see players complaining about a base entry like Rise and complaining that the end game wasn't good enough for them to be able to sink 400 plus hours into it. Monster Hunter games are naturally long. Completing a base game entry and getting an end game set can take anywhere from 20 to 100 plus hours depending on your playstyle, and that's a lot of time to put into any game. Not every entry of every series needs to live on forever or have some form of content that can keep you playing after you've essentially completed the core content. It's not feasible to expect this from every product out there, but more and more we see people demanding games provide this. A game can be a contained experience. I can play it off and on, complete it, and feel satisfied for reaching the end, instead of slighted due to there being nothing else to do. This was a big aspect of games back in the 2010s when every single player experience came with a multiplayer component to it in order to raise the game's lifespan 
lifespan. It's unnecessary. There's plenty of time to spend in world and there was no need to provide incentives for players to log in daily or weekly and help push them to a sense of burnout or worse, a sense of entitlement for future entries when they don't have as much content as the player expected. So while normal bounties were a fine concept, something to help accentuate your playtime in the moment, limited bounties often left a bad taste in my mouth. It was a weird feeling seeing a game that never employed them before begin to utilize mobile game era strategies of keeping player retention, and this would only get significantly worse leading into the Iceborne Ed game experience. Investigations meanwhile were a huge success in my eyes. Through hunting monsters and gathering tracks, players could acquire investigations that acted as challenges for various monsters found throughout the game. Maybe you had to hunt a Diablos with a maximum of two people, or maybe the amount of carts was limited. Maybe the time limit was lowered in some capacity, and players would be rewarded with a set of additional drops based off of these requirements. I think their biggest falter was making investigations a limited resource. I've never talked about this in a Monster Hunter video, but I am a big advocate for difficulty selection in games. Some people think this means defaulting to having an easy mode in all games, which is not what I'm after at all. People often misconstrue this for some reason. Rather, I think there's ways to make games easier and also more accessible for players, while also offering challenges for other players looking for them and I think investigations are a great example of attempting to apply that. Imagine if Monster Hunter allowed you to set certain conditions to make a hunt less difficult but also provide less rewards, or various challenge modifiers that make the hunts harder for better drops. That's essentially what investigations did here. I just think that taking investigations investigations and permanently applying them to the quest selection process would be better overall and could be a permanent fixture within the Monster Hunter series. If you never played Halo 3, they had something similar. Players could uh, try to rack up points or a high score in various levels and could amplify the points they gained by activating skulls, which provide additional challenges like, you know, Iron Man mode or having the enemy hit you harder. We could see this sort of dynamic difficulty selection fit easily within the quests of Monster Hunter World, and if someone was looking to join a quest, they could see what challenges or handicaps were applied before joining, thus allowing to both play how they want and be rewarded for higher difficulty encounters. Regardless, investigations were a great addition that didn't make it over to Rise, but I would love to see them applied in some capacity within Monster Hunter 6. Further up in Estera is the Canteen, which has also seen a large rework within this entry. I enjoyed this specific form of the canteen because it was more obvious how you were upgrading and unlocking various ingredients in comparison to generation 3 or 4. Rather than having two ingredients per food category, there could be upward of 30 options. And while the dairy category has been removed, the amount of customization in terms of platters is better than it ever has been. Players could mix and match six ingredients to create their own platters for various effects or use pre-made platters if they didn't want to bother. Going the extra mile could often reap large rewards. Rewards. As an example, a meal of the six unlockable drinks in Iceborne would always provide the feline safeguard skill and give hunters an additional cart, which was super useful for me specifically when hunting Fatalis in my latest run. Finding the right combination of food could provide guaranteed bonuses to the player through stat increases and feline skills, and unlocking these ingredients was much more organic. You could still unlock some of them through side quests, but you could also unlock them by simply gathering rare materials in the field. The first time you find a specific gathering, item, you may return back to Estera and find you have a new ingredient to work with. Unfortunately, it was hardly necessary to put this much work into it. There's almost never a situation where not choosing the chef's choice platter is necessary, and you're almost guaranteed to get a set of boons that will benefit you in some capacity within the hunt, which are fairly easy in base world. The canteen customization only becomes a real factor within the end game of world before Iceborne, and in the end game of Iceborne specifically, but this isn't the fault of the canteen itself, and I was happy to see these changes changes made only to be incredibly simplified again when the Portable team released Rise. Not the first time we've seen them do this anyway, since Portable 3rd had a very simple drink mechanic for the hot springs. Within the main level of Astera is a Wyverian who functions as the ecological research mechanic. In my previous opinion piece on World, I talked about how collecting tracks in order to find the monster was more of a chore than not. And while I do prefer paintballs to the shock of many, that didn't mean I was against research as a whole. Although, I do wish there was a 
another means of finding the monster on a map other than gathering tracks. Outside of finding the monster, tracks are essentially a means of progressing your understanding of a monster as a player. Research levels awarded for breaking monster parts and collecting tracks allow the player to get in-depth info about monsters' weaknesses to elements, their weak points in general, and just general information and flavor to help bolster a player's knowledge of the game world. I've never been particularly keen on reading codex or various books found lying around in RPGs, but I do appreciate earning a resource of important monster information through general play. And that's where researching these monsters via tracks really shines. Being able to go into my notes or the researcher and seeing exactly where the best place to attack a monster is as well as which element I bring with me makes it feel like I really earned the right to that information by conducting my own research. Tracks in that capacity are a fantastic feature. Where they fall flat is as a complete replacement for the old way in which we would find these creatures. Skills like Feline Oracle and items like Psycho Serum either don't exist anymore or are completely useless. It would have been better to integrate paintballs into the slinger and keep these items or abilities and have them integrated into how scout flies work overall. Let's say paintballs didn't work exactly like they used to. Since we have scout flies now, we could meld the mechanics and create something that complemented both of them. Maybe paintballs are some sort of aphrodisiac or food for scout flies, and when you paintball a monster, the scout flies turn pink and direct you towards the fleeing monster's direction. Maybe oracle and psycho serums show you a mental path towards the monster, similar to something we see in the Witcher. And then after raising the research level enough, your hunter would be at a point of knowledge where they can simply find the monster on the map as a reward. It just seems unnecessary to remove a mechanic that was designed around preparing your inventory to allow you to find monsters easier. Now it's simply a grind to raise the research level enough, and there's not much more you can do outside of a hunt to alleviate this. One of the nicer things about Astera was that it helped return the concept of the player home and have it get progressively better as the player progressed through the game's storyline. Players first start within a shared barracks of other hunters and fleet members and can later upgrade to their own personal quarters that is semi-customizable through allowing the player to place various endemic life that they have caught while out on the field. Monster Hunter World is full of endemic life. There's countless little creatures of various shapes and sizes that can be found throughout the maps in the game, and that's a big part thanks to the team wanting to make the world feel as alive as possible. What's better is that the player can actively interact with this ecology through the utilization of their new capture net. Players can sneak up on all of these creatures, shoot their net, and collect the endemic life so that it may be researched for various side quests or placed throughout their home to really make it feel alive. The private quarters even has a built-in aquarium for the sea-based life you'll be running into. This is really where you can see the work pay off for the development team. Areas really do feel alive and like there are creatures living within every nook and cranny. The ancient forest especially feels like it is simply bustling with all forms of life and this helps build immersion and world building that benefits the series overall. Near the end of the storyline, players can acquire one final upgrade to the private suite. I can't actually figure out where in Astera this is located as it's the size of a giant man but the area acts as a reward for the player. Higher quality lodgings, felines playing the harp, more room for endemic life to be placed, it was a return to a mechanic that many players appreciated from the previous entries. The upgradable housing aspect is almost a key staple within the series, but often is removed within entries to the point that it's a coin toss on whether or not you're going to see it applied in a new entry. I appreciated that it was added at the very least, but it was missing one core feature that you would expect to see within an entry that was so on Line focus, and we'll see what that is once we start talking about Celiana. Now, it should be no surprise that Astero also houses a workshop that contains a smithy for the player to upgrade their gear, but I'd like to cover that later on in the video. There's one other place that we can discuss now, however, and that's the inclusion of the training area where players can actively practice the tools at their disposal. It'd be hard to criticize this addition, and it's essentially a net bonus to the series and one that was a long time coming. Monster Hunter isn't particularly convoluted in its movesets, of its weaponry. There are some more complicated than others, but nothing that requires a PhD to understand, except maybe Charge Blade, and I think that's why it may have taken them so long to add this feature, one that we've seen in other Capcom entries for years now. 
Devil May Cry, for example, allows you to actively practice combos and weapons before going into a mission. Now, Monster Hunter allows you to do the same. You can practice the various weapons provided, practice using the tools and equipment at your disposal, and even practice interacting with the environment through climbing, sliding, and swinging on vines. It's the perfect area to allow newer players and veterans alike to hone their skills and become better players overall within a safe environment to learn. They can then take this knowledge into actual hunts and perform better for themselves and for other players. Iceborne even introduced a reworked area where players could practice the various clutch claw mechanics. The training area is just an added bonus and nothing more. It doesn't need to be more either, although Rise did rework it slightly by adding a mechanic that allowed the test dummy to attack you, allowing players to practice various situations. Astera really was an example of the development team flying a bit too close to the sun in terms of what could be done within the hub area. See, I made two Icarus references. The concept was just too large and the hardware at the time wasn't able to support it in a way that was enjoyable to the player experience in between quests. That being said, the mechanics that were with then were stronger overall than they had been in previous entries with some falters, you know, here and there. The farm and melding pot have their own sets of issues that I mentioned previously, and the bounty system being used as a means of extending the lifespan of the game in an artificial way. It seems that the team at least understood some of these failures going into world expansion, Iceborne, as the companion hub to this expansion ended up fixing many of the issues that plagued Astera overall. I'm of course talking about Celiana, which we'll look at now. If Astera was an example of the developers trying too hard to create something grandiose, Celiana was the perfect example of them dialing it back for a better overall experience. What made Celiana so nice was how they consolidated a lot of the functionality of Astera into one another for a more condensed and easier to access experience. Celiana specifically is so small in comparison to Astera that fast travel isn't really necessary, meaning regardless of what hardware you're playing on, you won't have to worry about multiple loading screens before you're even out on a hunt. The trade-off, of course, is the immersion and depth that Astera brought alongside it. No longer are you actively upgrading the various locations of the hub area, and aspects like the farm and the Argosia are all performed through a single NPC. Writing this actually made me realize I haven't talked about the Argosi yet, but there really isn't much to say. Functionally, the Argosi system is a shell of its former self, specifically in comparison to Monster Hunter Tri and 3 Ultimate. The previous system allowed the player to send out the Argosi to various locations in order to update the trading inventory upon its return, and players had to trade commodities in order to receive these items. In my previous retrospective about 3U, I praised the Argozi and similar mechanics for helping the world feel alive. There's features that fit better within the arcade-like environment of Monster Hunter that allow the player to feel like they are within a living world, and the fishing hamlet of Moga Village did that really well. While from a gameplay perspective, simplifying a lot of these old mechanics may seem nice, I often point out how some of the series' charm is lost in the process. This is something I've talked about regarding the farm multiple times. The simplicity is nice, but we lose something in the process, and there's a way to merge the old and new mechanics to make them the best of both worlds. The Argosian world is now a research point shop of random items. The player can choose what types of items the Argosi will bring back to trade for, and then the player will get a random set of items that they can purchase using the research points. There's no additional mechanics other than that, and the player can't choose specific items, but only groups of them instead. And now both the farm and the Argozi have been merged into one NPC in Celiana, leading to a more condensed hub area that is preferable for the gameplay loop, but ends up losing the immersion factor that Astera brought to the table. This is the balance I've mentioned previously in terms of charm versus quality of life. I prefer Celiana over Astera, but Astera clearly offered something that Celiana is now missing. This isn't something that solely happens between old school and new school, it happens within the same generation of games itself. A player can reason that much of the functionality we saw previously in Astera is still happening within Astera and merely getting shipped to Celiana, so it's not a big deal in that sense, but it's important to point out as it works as an example of how these characteristics within Monster Hunter may be lost from time to time, and it's up to you as a player to deem 
team, how important that is to you. To me specifically, I enjoy a balance of quality versus charm, and I believe proper design can give you a satisfactory amount of both. I believe World is weak within this aspect. Still, staying in Astera for an expansion's worth of content would have been excruciating, and players can grab quests for Iceborne from whichever hub they prefer, so regardless of what was lost or gained, the player now has the option of which they prefer, even though storyline events will often send you back to one or the other upon completing an assignment. You still visit Astera fairly often within Iceborne even though Celiana is the new hub of the expansion and you can freely fast travel to any location. Celiana does have one unique mechanic that Astera doesn't however and that's the Steamworks, a glorified minigame that doesn't really require player input in any meaningful capacity. The Steamworks rely on fuel in order to be effective. The natural fuel reserve of the minigame fills up in between quests and the player can provide different ores or coals specific to the Steamworks in order to raise the amount of fuel available. Actually playing the mini game is where player interaction hardly matters as it's pure RNG. Each round the player has to choose a sequence of three buttons in order without knowing said order beforehand. You can press you know, the X button and the game would tell you if you are currently on the right track or not, but there's no information you can infer from this to know which two buttons in the sequence are supposed to come next. Do I press the square next or the triangle button? You don't know and you'll never know except for one event where the Palicos helping at the Steamworks specifically tell you what buttons to press for a limited time. The development team seemed to understand how arbitrary this system was as they eventually allowed the player to simply hold the R2 button or the trigger on whatever controller you're using. I keep, I keep using PlayStation terminology, to simply input the same string of inputs every time and that's because your choice simply doesn't matter. So it's essentially a lottery that you can play as long as you have the fuel, and the rewards range from fairly lackluster to exceptionally useful. Getting the wrong sequence provides you with the lowest of potential rewards, getting them correct provides you with the mid-tier of rewards like Ancient Potions, an event can trigger which makes the Steamworks burst with energy, and getting the sequence right during this leads to the highest tier of rewards possible but all of the tiers have different items available. If I get a bonus chance and get the sequence right for the highest tier, I'm not guaranteed to get a Celestial Wyvern print, it's more like a 2% chance for that specific item. That didn't stop me from getting around 3 of them from my most recent playthrough, and that's kind of insane if you think about it. This mechanic that doesn't require any actual thought or true interaction from the player can lead you to earning multiple monster mantles or gems essentially for free. The concept of adding something lighthearted for the player to do in between quests one where it leads to a reward isn't new, and Rise specifically took this specific concept and turned it into a fairly straightforward daily jackpot lottery system, one that would reward the player with various consumables based on what kind of result they'd get, but never monster materials. It'd be a much more forgiving mechanic in World if it limited players to using it only once per quest and cost research points to interact with instead of fuel from random coal that they can gather later on in the game. Additionally, by making the player able to at least somewhat infer what the right sequences of events were, the overall system would be much more satisfying and less monotonous. Remove the ability to earn monster parts and provide different groups of consumable rewards based on how well the player interacted with the minigame instead of a system where I simply hold a button until I've run out of the resources to continue. In terms of upgrades, Celiana also reworked the concept of player housing. Now rather than upgrading to new lodgings as they progress, the player can instead have a fully customizable room with various furniture, walls, and floors to be changed at their convenience. Many of these objects and paintings, etc. can be unlocked through side quests or other non-core gameplay means. One of the coolest features about player housing that I haven't mentioned previously is the ability to set up a mannequin in various outfits or armor sets, allowing you to display your achievements in terms of equipment regardless of whether you're wearing the armor set or not. It adds a lot of personality to the room and helps the player express themselves in a way that wasn't previously possible. However, it'd be a waste if players couldn't show it off, so the Celiana Player Home also allows you to open open the room for other players to stop by and see what you've done with the place. Other than that, players can still place endemic life around the home and also change the music playing within. I believe out of any entry, World and Iceborne probably did player housing the best overall, and that's both in part thanks to the upgrading slash customization process and also just how beautiful the game looks. Monster Hunter has never been about the graphics until World, and they really pushed the MT framework for all it was worth in this entry, meaning everything looks fantastic. Something I've noticed I've said reading back through the script is that I refer to the villages as hub areas in the traditional sense. Astera and Celiana are both hub areas and you return to and spend most of your time there in between quests, you know? But Monster Hunter generally distinguishes the village and 
hub areas as something separate, specifically the gathering hubs that are hosted in each village. In most previous entries, you would see two options, either a lobby system that allowed for players to join up with one another in a hub area or a city hub that hosted anywhere from 1 to 100 players. An example of the former would be something like Portanzia in 3 Ultimate. An example of the latter would be like Locklack, which appeared in Monster Hunter Tri, or you know, Mineguard Town, or Dundorma. Both of these options, in my eyes, were highly successful in what they set out to do. Players could search for rooms that matched with their goals or create their own. Then, a party of up to four players could interact within a contained area and go out on quests. In city environments, they could see large groups of players walking around and interacting before heading into a smaller, more specific group. These areas were particularly effective when they had all of the solo functionality you would expect as well. If you could go online and still craft freely, use the various shops, and generally access any functionality that would benefit you on a quest, there was more reason to stay within an online lobby for a greater period of time. Not all hub areas were like this necessarily, but the contained nature of them made them very useful for players to easily interact with one another overall, especially since this was the only way to do so. This changed overall in world due to how players could interact with one another in terms of quests. While Estera and Celiana both hosted large 16 player hubs, there was a good chance you would rarely if ever see anybody within them, let alone organize with these random players to go on a quest. I mean, maybe you did but I hardly ever saw a reason to. This is for a number of reasons, but the biggest is how quests work. Players can enter into a quest and choose if they want to allow one to four players access to it as well. Players can then search for in-progress quests and join them if there is room to do so. Or players in a quest can shoot off an SOS flare to ask for help mid-quest. This made hunts more dynamic in the sense that your party could grow or shrink during the game, and most people seem to play with their friends or individuals they know online, meaning they can easily join up with their friends from the quest board without ever interacting with the gathering hub. And all of the functionality is accessible from the village, but not within the hub itself. Realistically, the village acts as its own online lobby. You can't see your friends running around Astera with you, but they are technically within their own instance of the town within your lobby if they choose to join it. If both you and your friends are in the gathering hub, you can see one another, but it's rarely necessary to do so outside of arena quests, and the idea that you'd ever see a hub with a full 16 players was lacking laughable at best. So this led to a weird lack of utilization that kept gathering hubs fairly barren. I would only ever see myself inside them when needing to interact with Cool of Taroth or Safi Jiva, or to eat a specific meal during seasonal events. It's really unfortunate because seasonal events actually change the entire aesthetic of each hub depending on what is running at the time. You get to unlock new Poogie and Handler costumes and see these changes as you walk around, but there's a good portion of players that may have never or rarely seen these. This was once again fixed in Rise, which allowed up to four players to join a lobby, but those four players could explore the village together. On top of that, hiring content and all multiplayer allowed quests were limited to the gathering hub area within that entry, meaning that both the village and gathering hub were utilized more than we saw in World and Iceborne. It was a better balance. The main fix for this would have been to do something similar in World, maybe not lock off the content to the gathering hub area, but only allow players to take part in hunts with other hunters through the hub, only look at SOSs through the hub, or search for ongoing quests through there as well. There needs to be more reason to explore these areas as they would naturally begin to have more and more experienced players hanging out within them and thus making them feel more alive and crucial, which was a huge design point for world overall that ultimately failed in this specific aspect. Celiana and Astera feel like they are on opposite ends of the design spectrum. Celiana tries to be compact and condensed, while Astera tries to be as big and grandiose as possible. Both villages suffer for this in their own ways, and it ends up being player preference, which you prefer. I personally prefer utilizing Celiana, but you miss out on a few interesting mechanics here. For example, captured monsters can be temporarily displayed and looked at within Astera. Regardless, I think the villages overall were fairly weak in comparison to the ones we've seen previously and also what we've seen in Rise. What they lack in functionality they make up for in graphical density, but graphics and high levels of immersion aren't necessarily something I see complementing an arcade style game like Monster Hunter overall. Now considering I've been talking about the village areas and the functionality within for around, I think I said 13 pages here, I think it's smart to move on to some more broad mechanics within the game, starting with Palicos.
World is a very narrative driven game. It's not a particularly good narrative and it's plagued with long, boring cutscenes that can't be skipped without a mod. But there are certain aspects of this storytelling focus that allow recurring mechanics to shine a little bit more. The Palico is a great example of this. In previous entries, the player would generally hire random Palicos with random stats. Later on, more and more customization was added overall and it was in World that this fully culminated into the creation and customization of your own personal Palico that would act way more like a true sidekick than they ever had in previous generations. Players can change the look of their palico and actively change their gear. The palico will be present in cutscenes and express themselves in their own personality. They are more present than they have been in the past, similar to Cha Cha and Kayamba in Monster Hunter Tri and 3 Ultimate, although not quite that present. Cha Cha and Kayamba are very prevalent. This is obviously for the best. It's hard sometimes to go back and not have as much personalization in my companions and this new Palico actively levels up with you and can unlock additional functionality based on some of the side content you take part in. Monster Hunter World wants you to explore these new large areas it has created. One of the ways to promote this exploration aspect is through finding each area's Grimmelkind tribe. Grimmelkinds are a group of Linian creatures that have various requirements depending on the tribe in order for them to bestow a new tool upon your palico. This is where the functionality of your palico is the most drastically changed. Rise, for example, has palicos of different styles and strategies, but you only have the one. So unlocking these tools that have various effects is your best way of setting up your palico for various situations. In my initial playthrough of the game, I think I only ever used the Vigor Wasp tool which allowed my palico to heal me regularly, but there's tools like the Plunder Blade which allow it to steal more monster materials, and tools like the Horn you find in the Coral Highlands that turn your palico into a a walking buff machine. There's a lot of options and being able to change it on the fly is super useful and welcomed. The tools even level up with repeated use which means you can see your palico actively becoming more effective and growing alongside you as you play through the storyline or through optional quests. You can run into other generated or player palicos within the environments themselves and your palico can essentially ask the other one for help in order to temporarily bolster your party with added hands. Pause? hands pause. Better yet, the Grimmel kind you befriended in each area have the ability to help you out by trapping monsters for you or disrupting them in other ways, thus giving you the opportunity to advance in damage or maybe get out of a sticky situation. The portable team ultimately went backwards slightly with this concept in Rise, but this is most likely due to the aesthetic nature of the portable team's design structure as well as the inclusion of the Palamute. You still create your personal Palamute and Palico at the beginning of the game, but they are less relevant to the overall narrative and you can also hire many other Palicos and Palamutes to go out on adventures with you. What's funny about World is it can be really good at adding in these little things that make the mechanics of old feel more personable while simultaneously getting out other mechanics. Palicos are potentially at their all time strongest as a feature within Generation 5, and I'd love to see them at the forefront more and more in the future, as well as a stronger narrative overall, but we'll get into that soon. In the meantime, I'd like to move on to the workshop and equipment within World as a whole. Get ready to hear about bad weapon designs and defender gear. You there. Are you part of the Fifth Fleet? Then that means the Elder Crossing is upon us again. There's a lot to talk about with equipment in Monster Hunter World and Iceborne. The series not only removed staple mechanics from equipment we saw previously, but also reworked and added a boatload of new features from the removal of Blade Master and Gunner sets to the new armor skill system, weapon augments, decoration slot levels, and much, much more. The armor skill system used in previous entries relied on accumulating a threshold of points until a skill would be activated. If you wanted a skill like Attack Up Small, you'd need to accumulate 10 points of the attack skill in order to activate it. Another five points to boost it to medium and an additional 5 or 10 in order to boost it to large or extra large which was introduced in generation 4. A lot of people found the old system confusing. Not only did you have to do basic addition to figure out how to activate your skills, you also had to deal with negative skills as most pieces of armor and decorations would remove points as a trade-off for the advantages. So there was a lot of give and take in the old system. Could you find a combination of armor pieces and decorations that could activate all of the skills you wanted at the tiers you wanted while also not limiting you through detrimental negative skills. I have a video on this very subject that I recommend watching to get an idea of the previous system if you don't fully understand it. Generation 5 and Monster Hunter World was the first entry to truly rework the armor skill system. Instead of accumulating points to activate tiers of skills, now each skill had a set amount of levels that could be increased immediately by equipping a piece of gear that had it. Again, consider the attack skill. By wearing a piece with one or two levels of attack, I immediately get bonuses from them. Equip another piece that has attack, and they stack to raise the overall level that's in a 
effect. No longer do players have to worry about complicated concepts like math and can simply stack abilities through various levels until they get their desired effect. This in turn removed the concept of negative skills, meaning the possibilities for sets were much higher than they ever had been before potentially too high? Considering that charms could stack these skills on top of gear and decorations, the list of skills that players could have active at one time could borderline triple or quadruple the amount of skills they could have in previous games. This isn't inherently bad, since this was the case, those skills obviously were reworked in some capacity so that it would require more levels for them to be as effective as their old school counterparts. One level of attack boost in world isn't going to be as effective as attack up small in Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate, so what you generally see online are players focusing on skills with large levels in order to get the most out of them, and then trickling down with some less effective quality of life skills. Maybe getting evade extender or evade window in there even if it doesn't mean fully maximizing damage. It feels more liberating in this sense and I appreciate it for that. It's a good system and I don't feel it necessitates heavy criticism. Really what it boils down to is whether or not it was an improvement on the old system and that comes down to player preference. I personally preferred the older system as unlocking a skill had a greater impact over adding a level or two. You really felt the changes a single unlock of a skill could bring and trying to balance skills through the addition and subtraction system via positive and negative points was an engaging endeavor when outside of a quest. Again, if you want more of a look at armor skills as a whole, I recommend checking out my video on the subject. Armor skills weren't the only major change to equipment, however. Previous entries in the series would break sets of armor into two categories. If you wanted to wear a Rathian set, for example, you had the choice between a Blade Master set and a Gunner set. This meant that regardless of what you were hunting and what you were hunting it with, there was a chance that its equipment could benefit you in some capacity. Blade Master armor would come with higher defense and skill center around melee while gunner equipment would have less defense but provide skills that benefited long-range combat. However, those are a thing of the past and world and continuing into Rise. Rather than having a set for Blade Master and then one for gunner type weapons, an individual set may be better for a specific weapon or playstyle rather than an archetype. Some sets may be better for the charge blade, some may be better for people using status weapons, some may be better for long-range classes, it's dependent on the monster. Rather than having you choose between Blade Master and Gunner, equipment now allows you to choose between alpha and beta sets. Alpha sets are pieces of gear that have more skills built into them. They usually also come with decoration slots, but less than you would see in a beta set. Alternatively, the beta set has less built-in skills, but more decorations for customization, making them perfect for fitting into various sets. Generally speaking, you may see a combination of all beta pieces or some beta and some alpha. It really depends on what you're building. There was also the inclusion later on of gamma sets that uh, were used and utilized, but I'm not really going to go into it too much. Overall, I really like this change in world, I think the concept of Blade Master and Gunner was ultimately unnecessary. There were even some sets in 3U where I'd want to wear a single Gunner piece instead from time to time because the skill points benefited me. Now players have access to potentially any piece of equipment and any style of set equipment. It's not just functionality that changes through alpha and beta, generally the visual design changes as well. Sometimes it's as lazy as a palette swap and other times it looks like a completely different set entirely. Unfortunately, Rise didn't seem to agree as the concept of alpha and beta sets was removed. Iceborne also added in the concept of bonuses through armor sets. Certain gear from specific monsters could provide a bonus if you wore a number of their pieces at one time. Raging Bracky, for example, allows Agitator to be raised an additional two levels. Three pieces of Teostra gear unlocks the Master's Touch ability, which is one of the silliest concepts in the game and can lead to you effectively never needing to sharpen again. These were cool ideas and concepts, ones we haven't seen fully revisited or realized yet, and it's not something I particularly see a need to go backwards on. Generally, my issue with some changes in general Generation 5 lie in how they removed key features with no real replacement or removed the entire charm and aesthetic of a previous game for something lackluster. The alpha and beta sets are a fully featured replacement for Gunner and Blade Master while also allowing more freedom in terms of what sets you may want to wear. It's net positive. I'd like to see the concept with the old school armor system potentially, but you know, I'll take what I can get here. Armor has also changed in how it is upgraded. Rather than being upgraded in tiers which require single armor stones, now the stones each have individual points point values and using multiple will help level a piece of armor up. By sacrificing multiple stones, the player can raise their armor multiple levels and in turn raise their defense up to some maximum level that is determined on the rarity of the armor. I'm curious why this change was made. It's not good or bad, it's just there. There is nothing inherently different between the two processes other than you now need more armor stones in order to level up your gear, but you're awarded them in abundance. My only guess is that it has to do with how prevalent stones are awarded to you through bounties and so this was 
was another means of finding ways to bring the player back to this live service experience. Pretty lame, but ultimately meaningless, and it doesn't affect the overall experience outside of how you perceive the team's design direction. Now, I've already gone over the changes between charms and decorations, but I want to point out how the slots themselves have changed. Previously, sets could have between one to three slots, all of the same size. If a decoration was level one, it would fill one slot. If it was level three, it'd fill three. This changed in world as players could have upward of three slots still, but those slots themselves would come in a variety of sizes. If you have a level four decoration, for example, it's not going to fit in a level one slot, but a level one decoration could fit in a level four slot because the decoration is smaller than the slot you're putting it into. This meant that decorations that have more advantageous abilities would generally be of a larger size, thus taking up your more limited selection of levels for slots. I really appreciated this change as well. If anything, it helped expand the concept of decorations and what they could do, and it even complemented the new armor system. Augmenting, on the other hand, leaves me with a lot of opinions to express. Augmenting as a concept was first seen in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate. The idea was that you could take fully upgraded weapons and grind even more in order to push them even further. I don't think I've ever actually expressed on my channel how much disdain I have for this concept, but I absolutely abhor the idea of augmenting gear that I have fully upgraded. I can tell what some of you are thinking. How can you dislike augmenting? It's just another bonus to your weapon. And it's definitely that, but consider this. How does it feel to finally finish your set? To finally gather the materials necessary to have the top tier rarity weapon that you grinded hours for, only for it to turn out that that weapon still isn't finished because there's this brand new system introduced where you need to grind even more in order to truly maximize it for endgame content. That's not for me. I've talked about this before, but Monster Hunter is centered around its core grinding gameplay loop. When the game tries to add additional grind for the sake of it, either through the idea of augmenting or through the concept of the Guiding Lands, don't worry, we'll get to it later, this series begins to heavily falter. Monster Hunter's strength is that when you finish a set, there's still something to do with it, such as fighting tougher monsters, but fighting those tougher monsters shouldn't be a goal to just make an even stronger weapon. They should be a challenge with your best gear possible. Sure, they lead to their own sets and their own weapons, but those don't necessarily need to be better than what you have now. They simply open up more options for what you can choose to wear. The concept of Monster Hunter is so strong because if you feel you are done with the set, you can just go make another one, which in turn may have you fighting a monster you haven't before. But maybe you'll try a new weapon and need to grind for that. Maybe you want to create every type of a specific weapon. Maybe you'll just put the game down when you're done. That's actually an incredibly valid option. Monster Hunter doesn't have to last you 400 hours, and when you have a game that can already potentially facilitate hundreds of hours of gameplay, and you decide to just pump even further for the sake of keeping it alive, that's where the experience starts to falter, and you start considering if you're ever going to reach the finish line. It's one thing to reach the end and find something new to do, but it's another to be working towards the end, only for the finish line to be pushed further and further away. Regardless of how I feel about the concept itself, the core mechanics are also fairly lackluster, at least until Iceborne, where they get marginally better. In base world, a player could augment their weapon by using items called streamstones, which, get this, were another RNG mechanic. By fighting tempered monsters within specific tiers of difficulty, players had the chance of obtaining stream stones which would then be generated into a more specific type of stone. Similar to decorations, you had a chance to obtain a stone and then had to further roll the RNG to see what specific type of stone it was. Armor, on the other hand, could be upgraded further with generic materials so that it could be further leveled up through the normal armor stone process. Once you had the materials to augment a weapon, said weapon would have a set of augmentation slots and you'd then have to choose which special ability to attach to it. You could raise the attack, upgrade a decoration slot, raise the defense, and more. There was even a health regeneration effect. In Iceborne, the augmentation process for weapons is reworked slightly. It's mostly the same, but how slots function has been reworked. Now abilities can take up a number of slots, and if you wish to stack abilities, they take up even more. To help with this, you can augment the slots themselves to allow for more abilities. The materials necessary for a lot of these augments require the guiding lands, which Again, I promise we'll get into. We kind of have to. It's such a prevalent aspect of Iceborne's endgame and some I have an incredibly strong disdain for. World and Iceborne brought with them the returning mechanic of layered equipment which we first saw in Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate. What Iceborne also brought with it was layered weaponry and this was an important inclusion for one reason. The weapon designs within Monster Hunter World and Iceborne are inexcusably awful. Like, truly 
truly, truly awful. An almost unanimous opinion within the fandom is how poor of a job was performed on the design of the weaponry overall. I mean, there's exceptions in there, don't get me wrong, but when you have shit like the Bracky Dio's drumsticks and countless other boring examples of slap-on designs that are just one after the other copy pasted from the starting weaponry, you can just tell there's a huge issue here. Monster Hunter has always balanced between fantastical realism and pure action anime designs. We've had sets that look like the armor of medieval knights, and sets that make you look like some sort of futuristic super soldier. Even in World, a majority of the armor designs are more on the excessive side than not, and this is a game that tries to drench itself in its version of realism and life. So it's inexcusable when we see the majority of weapons within this game be a cut and paste job between one another, only for this to not be the case with some unique trees and further into the end game of Iceborne. The ball has never dropped harder than here, except for a few key situations like the Clutch Claw and the Guiding Lands. It's not the end of the world of course, you can still play the game and enjoy it for its mechanics, but a large part of what makes the grind more mentally manageable is knowing you're working towards unlocking cooler and more unique designs overall. We get that with armor, but not with weapons. I've seen a lot of people online try to defend this change. The most frequent answer or excuse I see for this issue is that the developers put so much focus on the environments that the weapons had to suffer due to this. Does that really justify it to you? Does the fact that they made the ancient forest really dense with life make up for the fact that your weapon is realistically going to look the same throughout the entirety of your base game playthrough or through the main storyline of Iceborne? It doesn't for me and many others. There's even a mod on the Nexus that replaces the majority of slap-on designs with something more akin to their old-school counterparts. Development is a balancing act. You can't realistically say to the developers that they should wait to release the game until more weapon designs are created because it's not actually up to them. What I can criticize, however, is where they decided to focus their development efforts and how the balance was skewed so far on the side of environments and so little on the side of weapons. So glory be to the release of layered weapons via the Smith and Iceborne players can now make their weapon look like one of the few good designs in the game instead of whatever the hell this is. The layered system is also simplified for the most part in both the base game and expansion, only requiring the player to spend minimal amount of materials in order to craft them. This would then be carried over into Rise. But not for weapons, only for armor. Moving on to other equipment features, World also introduced the concept of mantles, but not the monster hunter drop, uh, specifically equipment. A hunter tool that could be equipped in order to provide a variety of different features. The player could use the ghillie mantle to hide from monsters, the temporal mantle to dodge attacks, fire mantle to boost their fire resistance, and many more. It was a fantastic system as it was a means of giving the hunter a temporary strategic boost while out on a hunt. The type of mantle and how you interact with it determines how long it will stay active before going on cooldown. The ghillie mantle doesn't deplete while crouching and standing for example, or if it does it's incredibly slow. However, as soon as you attack or get attacked, it's gone. Other mantles can remain on while attacking, but mantles like Temporal deplete faster after dodging an attack that would have normally hit your hunter. It's a great system, very balanced. I really appreciated it, and it only got bolstered in Iceborne when players could then upgrade each of their mantles through side quests in order to gain the ability to slot decorations into them. Slotting a decoration into your mantle meant that while equipped, the mantle would apply the skills onto you temporarily. Mantles like Fire Resistance benefited from this highly because of their naturally long activity period, meaning you could go through two to three minutes of a hunt with an extra two levels of a specific skill. Mantles as a design, I have been told, were part of a cutting room floor in terms of design features for Monster Hunter Frontier. A design that the team may have come up with was dropped and then revived by the mainline team later on. Take that with a grain of salt, however, as I've never been able to find an interview citing this. Overall, the Mantle system was a fantastic mechanic and led to a lot of fun concepts that we could see reworked in other entries. Things like the glider mantle would be fantastic. Imagine having a mantle like that in Rise that lets you glide from the top of a mountain across the map. There's a lot of untapped potential within the concept, and I hope we get to see it revisited rather than dropped as the mainline games tend to do for cool and unique features. A less enjoyed aspect of new equipment and tools for me would have to be the slinger. In design, the slinger feels like a concept piece for what would later become wire bugs. Realistically, World and Rise were being actively developed within overlapping timeframes, so this wouldn't be a surprise to see the portable team try to rework the concept as they have with many other world features. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with the slinger, I think the idea of giving the player environmental ammunition 
to help corral a monster is a good concept in theory, but the way the slinger had to be integrated into already existing items is what I found to be the most unappealing. I know I've mentioned this opinion in past videos, but the idea of having flash bombs attached to the slinger does more harm than good, mostly due to how it causes items like flash bombs to overlap with your current slinger ammunition. This means that if you grab ammunition off the ground, then equip your flash bombs to use, you'll then need to unequip your flash bombs afterward in order to have access to your slinger ammo. And while we're not at the clutch claw discussion just yet, this process often found me clutching onto a monster's head for a wall bang only for me to realize too late that I still had my flash bombs equipped. The slinger is great for environmental exploration, it allows you to reach areas you normally couldn't, and is also a means of climbing faster when scaling the various vertical areas around the map. I think overall the slinger was a fine addition to the hunter's equipment, but I believe a more strict separation between what was for a slinger and what wasn't would have benefited the new tool overall. Equipment in World and Iceborne is on the more positive side than not but there is a few core issues with the progression of equipment near the end game. Monster Hunter World and Iceborne have an issue with introducing new content through updates and quests and making the equipment from those updates generally leaps and bounds better than anything previous to it. This leads to a power creep issue within the series. The philosophy seems to be that if an update comes out that makes the players more powerful, then the next update needs to be slightly more powerful and offer better gear than was previously available. Then the next update will do the same, over and over, until you're left with hunters that only only need to make it to the final update and grind that specific monster in order to create a set that will trump any other engagement within the confines of World and Iceborne. You can see this with the release of Alatreon, potentially Cool Taroth, Safi Jiva, and of course Fatalis. These updates almost always shake up the meta in some way and not in giving the player more options or freedom in terms of what they can make thanks to the new equipment with new skill sets, but instead hyper limits the trajectory of the player into needing the new gear to more easily handle the new content. The best gear in the game isn't necessary, of course, but you're going to have a rough time if you're not getting it, and nowhere does this show a fault in Iceborne's overall design than in things like the Guiding Lands where the grind is so excessive that you lose all motivation to even engage in it. But before that, there's another major issue I have with equipment based on some of the features I just mentioned. I'm talking about Cool of Taroth and Safi Jiva specifically. Cool of Taroth and Safi Jiva as concepts for sieges are fairly interesting. They're large monsters that progress through phases in different locations on the map based on how far you can push them. They're not necessarily meant to be beaten in one go, but can be pushed to that point. It's a system reminiscent of repelling elders in Freedom Unite, but now they expect you to do this with a group of four party members and a greater group of individuals overall. Realistically, almost anything in Monster Hunter can be soloed without too much trouble. Certain fights may be particularly difficult, but it's always an option. It's even technically an option within these new sieges, but not expected at all. Safi and Kulv expected you to go in with a party of four while other parties of individuals were doing the same thing. You all contributed to the overall success of a siege without ever seeing anyone outside of your own party, and the further you could push the monster overall, the closer you would be to killing it on the next Next hunt, and the further you could go, the better rewards you could receive. That would be fine if not for the fact that Kulv and later Safi ended up offering some of the best weapons in the game, and these weapons were obtained through a sub-RNG mechanic. Cool of Taroth would award the player with random weapons of random rarities, and those weapons would have random elements. This is similar to the concept of relic weapons in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate, where some of the strongest weapons could only be found through praying you not only got lucky enough to have a weapon dropped, but that it had the stats necessary to be useful. I don't know if I need to explain why I don't like this mechanic. I believe Monster Hunter's focus on RNG drops for gathering and monster materials are good enough, adding in making it necessary for me to farm a large siege over multiple hunts for drops that may not provide me the weapon I want, and even if they do, not provide me with the stats I need is almost unacceptable in my eyes. It just adds an extra thick layer of randomness to a game that is already asking me to try my luck at getting the materials I want, and those materials are generally fairly easy to get with the right preparation. You can get guaranteed drops or boosted rates based on which parts you break. You can use lucky vouchers in this game, or certain feline skills. There's ways of increasing your luck in the series for monster parts, but Cool of Taroth feels like a large chore that leads to nothing but a dice roll. At the very least, they released a master rank hunt for her that wasn't tied to the gathering hub siege mechanic. I believe this was used to upgrade the weapons further, but I never really took part in it too much because I just disliked it so much. Safi Jiva suffers partially from the same problem. Not only do you have this new level of RNG on what type of weapon you'll earn and what stats it will have, but you now also need to try and roll for Safi Jiva specific augments and bolster them through repeatedly looking for them. Players can spend Dracolite 
to raise the awakened level of their weapon. Once awakened, a set of buffs is displayed for the player to choose from and apply to their weapon. These abilities have rarities, and by applying low rarity versions of these buffs, you have a better chance of seeing their higher rarity version on future awakens. And awakening is essentially limitless. You fight Safi Jiva multiple times to eventually defeat it. Through this process, you can earn Draculite and maybe eventually get the weapon you want. Then you're not done because you need to awaken your weapon multiple times in order to get all of the abilities you deem necessary. Not done after that either, now you need to head to the Guiding Lands to get those levels up so you can earn materials to actually augment your weapon so you're getting the absolute most out of it. It's insane. And while Safi Jiva can technically be done solo, especially after an update, it's still expected to be done with multiple individuals over multiple attempts, and that feels very against the grain in terms of Monster Hunter's overall design. Needless to say, I wasn't a fan of this mechanic. In the past, I likened a lot of these multi-tier sieges to MMO mechanics, something you probably see in Frontier but wouldn't expect in Mainline. Kind of like Raviente if you watched my Frontier videos on it. Now before moving on to the Clutch Claw, I feel it's important to at least mention the concept of Defender Equipment. After the release of World and with the release of Iceborne, a set of equipment was released including a Defender weapon for each weapon tree and the Guardian Armor. The Guardian Armor was accessible right at the start of World and bolstered the player's defense, and it was the same for weapons which started out powerful and could be easily upgraded as you progressed through the base game. The equipment would then fall off heavily into Iceborne, thus promoting the use of Master Rank gear. There's a lot of negative opinions towards Defender gear overall, especially with it showing up recently in Rise before Sunbreak is even out. A lot of players seem to believe that while the gear allows newer players to get through the brunt of World so that they can experience Iceborne with everybody else, it forces said players to hit a wall upon reaching Master Rank that may make them drop the game or have them playing like a novice with people that have hundreds of hours clocked in. I don't personally have an issue with Defender gear in concept or even how it's implemented here. I think the real issue is how World is designed as a whole, being a pseudo live service or more like an MMO in this regard. Compare it to Final Fantasy XIV which does something similar. Players can pay real money to boost characters to 10 levels below the maximum, or even pay to skip large swaths of the storyline so that they can be closer to the newer content that most players are taking part in. This may mean they're more green going into the later content, but it's up to the player to learn the game after this choice. They aren't locked out of the old content they skipped, and they aren't locked out of learning. They just have the added responsibility of learning mechanics, and if it is their choice to do so, they're saving boatloads of time in order to get to where the community or their friends may be currently. The same can be said for World. This is the first entry that had a paid expansion instead of making us rebuy the Ultimate Edition, and it's also on multiple consoles. Defender Gear was a great way for me to get my PC save file up to Iceborne so I could start the Iceborne content considering I played on PS4 originally. It's a great way for newer players to get closer to where their friends are overall. This isn't a game that segments off single player and multiplayer quests, and also scales quests based on how many players are with you at the time, so it makes sense that players may want to get through the early storyline quickly without making their friends wait for them to finish all of the narrative and cutscenes. So really, Defender Gear is a good option for players that want to skip some of the weaker sides of World's design. It's an understanding from the developers that the multiplayer aspect isn't as seamless as it once has been, and gives players the opportunity to get closer to where the community may be overall. Previous entries didn't need this because you could simply have your friends help you with key quests and there was no grand narrative stopping progress while a cutscene played. Instead, players could blow through these quests with their more prepared friends or even randoms, and this is essentially the same thing Defender Gear is doing. So what's the best change here? Well, if World wasn't so narrative-driven and didn't structure quests the way that they do, it'd be much easier for a player to simply go into multiplayer content with their friends and progress quickly through hub content while cleaning up village quests later. Additionally, Defender Gear falls under the don't like it, don't use it category. The nice thing about certain features within the game is that the entirety of the game isn't designed around it. World is designed around the new open environments, so trying to use mechanics as they once were or not using certain features like the camp and fast travel negatively affects the player. But Defender Gear was added as an afterthought and doesn't restrict the player if they don't use it. The player would then just need to complete all of the assignments to progress to Iceborne, and realistically World is so short in this regard that it wouldn't take that much more time to do. You can get from World to Iceborne incredibly fast with minimal grinding. Defender Gear just speeds up this process, so I don't have an issue with Defender Gear 
here overall, but rather how world is structured and naturally promotes the facilitation of this new equipment. It seems Rise reworked it based on its own changes as well. Now Defender Gear is just a means of blowing through low rank to get to the actual meat of Rise, and it was already incredibly quick to do this anyway thanks to Rise quests being the easiest they've ever been and also the inclusion of license tests that raise your hunter rank so you don't have to repeat the low rank in the gathering hub. So is Defender Gear necessary? No, but is it a nice option to have? For sure. If weapon designs are one of the most hated aspects of World and Iceborne's development, the introduction of the Clutch Claw and the mechanics surrounding it have to be the absolute most hated across the entire community. There's definitely people out there that enjoyed it overall, but for the vocal majority, Clutch Claw is made out as one of the worst additions ever within the Monster Hunter franchise. But is that the case? Yes. Okay, it's not that bad. It's pretty close, however. The release of Iceborne not only added in new abilities for each weapon, but it also added in new functionality for the Slinger in terms of the Clutch Claw. Players now had the ability to grapple a monster at any time. They could turn the monster around, shoot it into walls, and even soften parts of the hide in order to make temporary weak points that would allow for more excessive damage for a short period of time. Monster Hunter in its design expects the players to not only learn the habits of a monster in order to find openings to attack, but also locate and utilize their weak points based on which weapon they are using. You want to have the right element for the job, you want to know what you're doing, and there's a lot to keep track of during a hunt. The developers then said, what if, regardless of the weapon being played, there was an additional upkeep mechanic all players had to keep track of during the entirety of a hunt? That's the softening mechanic. Players can clutch onto a monster and then perform a large attack to soften the part that they were clutched to. Lighter weapons require two attacks, and heavier weapons only require one. Afterwards, the monster will have a softened hide for a couple minutes that allows the user to not only utilize it as a weak point, but also gain the benefits of armor skills that expect you to hit weak points as well. And as a mechanic by itself, this sounds fine. It's a way to guarantee additional damage that would allow the hunter to complete the hunt faster, right? Wrong. The health pools of Iceborne monsters are bolstered due to the expectation from the development team to utilize the claw mechanic, meaning if you don't use it at all, hunts are going to be exceptionally longer than you are used to. So now there's a required upkeep mechanic that you have to pay attention to on top of everything else in order to make sure you can kill a monster without timing out. To be honest, softening is probably the most egregious out of all of these mechanics to me. The other mechanics are bonuses that have their faults but are overall good in concept. While hunting a monster, there's an opportunity during certain flinches where the monster will briefly stand still. This is an opening that encourages hunters to clutch onto the monster, thus resetting the stagger animation and giving the player a guaranteed opportunity to soften the monster or shoot it into a wall. I don't personally have major issues with this mechanic. It fits within the concept of the clutch claw as some monsters do not give you natural openings in order to utilize it, meaning it makes sense to have some sort of guaranteed chance to latch onto the monster and perform one of your clutch claw actions. One of the major issues with claggers is how they interrupt the natural flow of the hunt. Attacks and combos that may have worked previously can get suddenly interrupted when the monster not only flinches, but staggers away, meaning that you are often seeing this mechanic activate at inopportune times and losing out on damage, or various other mechanics. Longsword, for example, can miss a counter or force light slash because the monster is suddenly sent reeling backwards across the map. Wall bangs are another gripe for many players due to how the mechanic works and the damage it produces. By clutching to the head of a monster and firing off your slinger ammo, the player will then launch a monster forward in the direction it was facing. Most players would want to attack the monster while clutched one or two times to make sure that it is facing a wall as a monster shot towards a wall will produce a wall bang guaranteeing a topple and also producing a large amount of damage overall. Wall bangs specifically trivialize large swaths of hunts in Iceborne. They're guaranteed to work if the monster is not enraged meaning that you can get a large amount of them off in a single hunt. Sometimes two in a row before the monster enrages as the enrage mechanic can be triggered by the amount of times you try to turn the monster. If you get a natural wall bang without turning the monster, you could potentially see another right away. It's truly excessive damage. The main issue with the clutch claw ties back to what I was just talking about in terms of the don't like it, don't use it mechanic. It makes sense to not use defender weapons. It doesn't make sense to not use the clutch claw. It's not some net bonus for you overall because the monsters are designed around the expectation that the player will be utilizing it. More so, it actively interrupts the hunt as we have experienced it for years. Now 
you may have the monster back away from you and expect you to clutch onto it. Now you can cause excessive damage and countless topples by using it, and it's universal. If this was tied to one weapon type as an added ability and wasn't expected to always be out on a hunt, the Clutch Claw would have been guaranteed to be a much more popular mechanic. Better yet, make it an optional tool, lower its overall effectiveness, and scale monsters back to what we saw in base world's HP pools. Equipment overall in World and Iceborne has seen many reworks and changes, none necessarily for the better. Poor weapon designs, mechanical inclusions like the Clutch Claw and to a lesser extent the Slinger, and excessive RNG grinding in the endgame have left a bad taste in my mouth overall. At the very least we have interesting mechanics like the mantles and the armor designs to make up for it, even the rework of decoration slots is welcome. Now that we finally have all of that out of the way, I'd like to tackle another major aspect of Monster Hunter World, the narrative. Shall we tear? Fear not. This is the handler portion of the video, so if you want to skip ahead now, this is the time to do so. Well, not really. I won't actually be talking specifically about the handler overall in this segment, and more about the characters and narrative in general, and how they overall seem to fall flat. I mean, we saw what happens when I talk about the handler, so let's not go down that route again. Monster Hunter World released in 2018. That's only four years ago from the creation of this video. I'm super curious what year the developers were living in, however, because it couldn't have been 2018, a time in which I believe we can all unanimously agree that no one appreciated unskippable cutscenes. I don't think anyone ever appreciated them, to be fair, but by 2018, I feel like it should have been a developer standard to not include them. Monster Hunter is rife with some of the most boring, unskippable dialogue and cutscenes in any game I have ever played. Scenes filled with exposition and character introductions to some of the blandest individuals I've ever met. They make up for this slightly in Iceborne when a majority of the cutscenes feature one monster attacking another, acting as a good showcase of what the developers were able to achieve graphically. What is the story in World anyway? It essentially boils down to people coming to a new location within the world of Monster Hunter, investigating Sora Magdaros specifically, and then later Xenojiva. That's it. What is causing the elders to go nuts? What's causing migrations? Oh, it's a big elder dragon that has one of the most boring fights in the game. Oh, actually, it's this alien monster that can shoot laser beams so hot it melts to the floor beneath it. Okay, that sounds kind of sick, but trust me, in practice, it's not. It's actually really awful. It's just a surface level storyline, and normally that wouldn't matter in Monster Hunter. Many older Monster Hunter players didn't play the game for the narrative, but for the gameplay specifically. Having a surface level narrative was par for the course within these games, yet now we were forced to watch this narrative for hours of cutscenes and there was no way to escape it outside of taking a walk and grabbing a cup of coffee. And the characters don't really make up for this either. It's funny because a lot of individuals who watched my handler video seemed to think I was dismissing all criticisms of her, when in reality her and all the characters within the series simply don't matter. They aren't developed enough for us to build an emotional connection to, so what we do end up liking about them is usually surface level level as well. People like the commander because he says where's my dragonator, people like the ace cadet because he's from Monster Hunter for you, people like the serious handler because she's not your handler, etc etc etc. There are reasons to dislike these characters, actual criticisms about their actions, their blank state personality, and how none of them actually helped you with anything through gameplay outside of exposition. It's understandable why people found these characters annoying. I found them annoying too, and inescapable. All I'll really say further on this topic is that the PC version has a mod that allows you to skip all cutscenes, and it makes a fresh playthrough infinitely better and more manageable. I believe you have Jowbaggle to thank for that one, even with said mod, however, there's still plenty of non-cutscene dialogue that you have to sift through. While it makes sense to include a grander narrative based on what the team was attempting to achieve with the large open environments and all the finer details, Monster Hunter is at its strongest when it lets you bypass this aspect of it so that you can quickly dive into the core gameplay. Speaking of gameplay, let's talk about how quests are structured and what they include. Questing has changed significantly within this entry of the franchise in multiple ways. Some of these ways are to better help the game tie in with the story. 
Others are to help emulate a more online or traditional MMO experience. Throughout this video, I've been mentioning that this game was designed with the live service model in mind. When booting up world and selecting your character, you're thrown into a lobby before even accessing the gathering hub. The game expects you to be online regardless of where you are. Being in Astera or the gathering hub doesn't matter as long as you are still within a lobby and can interact with other players in the same lobby within some limited capacity. You don't have to be online, and the game does allow all content to be accessed with you being so, but all of the design decisions expect you to be. This design structure translates into the quest format as well. Hunters can now drop in and out of hunts that are currently taking place. You could be hunting a monster and suddenly someone else pops into the area to help out, but in turn also scales up the difficulty of the hunt. When I say difficulty, I really just mean the monster's health pools and part break or status thresholds. Nothing else really changes in the grand scheme of things. Hub scaling is a bit of a double-edged sword. On one hand, it helps make fights dynamic and feel like the monster monster is up to the task in terms of fighting between 1-4 to four players. On the other, solo players end up having a much easier time with content because all quests within the game can be fought with the expectation that there's only one hunter. In previous entries, multiplayer quests were locked into specific health and threshold values, ones that expected you to bring at least one other person along, but that were almost always doable from a solo perspective, just harder. This is just a mechanical consequence of how they set up the idea of multiplayer in older games. It wasn't necessarily the intention to make a tough solo experience, it just ended up being the result. That's why I can't fault the developers too much for scaling back this difficulty and allowing players to play through the entirety of the storyline in a setting that feels balanced for them regardless of how they play. I often look back on the previous entries and their difficulty with fond memories, but realistically, hub scaling feels like it is the way to go in terms of proper design and player experience. But that doesn't mean World or Rise, for example, aren't just naturally easier games anyway. World and Rise both have issues with offering the player too much in terms of abilities while not doing the same for the majority of the monsters. This is why blowing through base world storyline is such a breeze regardless of if you're using defender gear or not. You can compare world's low and high rank to the low and high rank village quests of Freedom Unite and you will find that Freedom Unite is much more methodical, punishing, and time consuming overall. So hub scaling is different in terms of Monster Hunter's design but it's not a bad thing to include. It makes sense that they would do something like this as the narrative gets stronger in the game as that's what a lot of players purchasing the game want to experience. Creating a large narrative is a deliberate design and marketing choice to help drive sales within the global market. Monster Hunter is more personable to newer players when it has a story to follow and unfortunately more alienating to a global audience when the things have less focus on them. And having players be able to join you on the fly regardless of when you started a quest is a cool feature an abusable one for sure, but still actively useful within the co-op experience of World, which I haven't talked about too much, but is a huge focus on Monster Hunter overall. It's a co-op game more than a solo game, and making it easier for players to connect is positive. What isn't positive is some of the limitations that the development team decided to implement due to this online design, namely the inability to pause while out on a hunt. Monster Hunter is a game about learning and optimizing. When you get particularly good at the series, a hunt may take less than 10 minutes, less than 5 even, but on average, hunters may be in an encounter for around 20 or so. This isn't an actual statistic, I'm more theorizing. For me, I'd find hunts could range anywhere from 5 to 40 depending on my set and the monster. Late Iceborne hunts would take me much longer, for example, so it's important within a game like this to have some ability to pause as you can't always complete a hunt in one sitting. We're human. We have lives and things come up, even little things that may pull us away from the screen for a minute or only a second. Previous entries understood this and provided a pause option for when you were playing solo and needed to take a minute. World, for some reason, missed out on this, most likely due to them feeling that, since the player is always considered online, we want them to always be interacting somewhat with the lobby. Pausing in this way could cause a few issues for them, but in reality, it, it really doesn't. It's almost an inexcusable design choice to not include a pause feature one I see many players still complain about to this day. It's even more inexcusable when the portable team managed to have a similar quest and hub system in Rise, but still allowed players to pause while playing alone. As I touched on in the start of this section, quests have been affected by more than the online component. The narrative of Monster Hunter is hyper-present in this entry, and the developers seem to want to have players take part in specific quests in specific orders rather than more freeform settings we've seen previously, like key quests. In every other entry, including Rise, players could have a selection of key 
complete quest that they could complete in any order in order to progress to the next rank of Rise even took it a step further and had so many key quests that you didn't need to complete all of them, giving you even more choice in what you took part in. World is then forced to limit the player to select assignments based on where the player is in the story. It's progression through the story and not key quests that advance them through their ranks and eventually from low to high to master. As a storytelling tool, assignments make a lot of sense. Even if limited, the player is sometimes given multiple assignments at once, meaning there's some freedom of choice. But at the same time, assignments are one aspect of world that is so against the grain of the franchise's design that it leads to a very on-rails and limiting experience most returning players probably didn't expect. I didn't expect it either. That's not the only thing that limits the player through assignments, however. Since assignments are directly tied to the storyline, there are a fair amount of instances in which the player has to go in solo and can't play with their friends until some walking segment or sequence of cutscenes has completed. Imagine playing Monster Hunter with your friends and you have to tell them that you're going to go watch a 10 minute cutscene first. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but when cutscenes and walking segments aren't skippable, the time really does feel like it adds up. And there's no real easy fix for this. If you're going to have long narratives and cutscenes, even if you can skip them, some players are going to want to watch them. One way Rise tried to help alleviate this somewhat was that they not only made these scenes skippable, but they also allowed players to unanimously vote on skipping, so there's at least a chance that you won't have to watch the cutscene. Even then, the biggest cutscenes are saved for the mid and end points of the game, where World tries to differentiate differentiate itself from the previous entries with its large narrative and long exposition. Rise found a way to tell a story similar to previous entries with a bit more cinematic flair and wasn't entirely in your face about it. It's unfair to completely compare World to a game that came out after it, but the fact remains that these games were in development close to each other. It seems weird that the team would look at the older games and even a newer entry and think they were on the right track with how they were setting up the online and storytelling experience, because they weren't. They did a really bad job of it. When players do complete an assignment, the monster they were fighting usually shows up within the optionals category. Optionals act as an infinitely repeatable quest similar to what you would see in older entries. Some monsters you find naturally through their assignments, while other optionals only show up after you spot the monster in the wild. This is to promote exploration, and to be fair to the base game, it's hardly ever necessary to actually go out searching for the monster, so you can unlock the optional pretty easily. It's more prevalent near the end of Iceborne when you need to see a Tiastra, for example, in order to unlock being able to fight it in mass to rank, but you have no idea when a Tiastra is going to show up or where. These little things World does to promote exploration end up limiting the player that just want to hunt the monster without all the fluff. One cool aspect of optionals is the ability to unlock special arena quests, however. By capturing a monster, you can then hunt the same type of monster in a dedicated arena, meaning a portion of the exploration is simplified, while also giving you access to tools like cannons and a ballista and a dragonator. It's like a little bonus quest that rewards you for capturing the target instead of just slaying it. While I have many grievances with the structures of quests as a whole, there's still plenty of good extra content to take part in. World was one of the games to truly go crazy with some of their event quests in particular. Generally speaking, event quests in previous entries would be some form of monster or set of monsters with altered stats or sizes, little gimmicks here and there that can make the event feel special and once completed could offer various rewards. It's a good system, and the older generation does it well, but to World's credit it truly takes it to the next level by not only doing the same, but also adding in new concepts like additional monsters for specific collaborations. There's an entire Witcher questline that allows players to interact with and play as Geralt and fight both a Leshen and an Ancient Leshen. Now the quality of that fight is pretty lackluster overall, but the level they went through for the collaboration itself deserves a lot of praise. It's the same with Final Fantasy XIV and the release of Behemoth, which led to its own sequence of event quests from fighting a giant Kuluyaku to Behemoth itself, and the mechanics surrounding the Behemoth fighter designed in a way to emulate the FFXIV model. A lot of thought and care went into a large portion of the events, and it would be wrong for me to not praise them for it. That doesn't mean they're perfect though. Many of the event quests within World were on a cycle basis for a long period of time, and some may still be, meaning that they weren't available to players at all times once released. In previous entries, players would simply download the event quests as they were released and as long as they had them on their hard drive or memory card they would always be accessible. Now event quests have the ability to come and go, limiting the player on what they might want to run because it simply isn't accessible. Another example of the online live service model continuing to restrict players gameplay experience. Not only that, but licensing becomes a huge factor as well, to the point that we have seen the removal of their Assassin's Creed and even the Monster Hunter movie events. The Monster Hunter movie. Let that sink in for a second. A Monster Hunter product had to be removed from a Monster Hunter game due to issues surrounding the production company of the movie. 
it's ridiculous. Event quests are good for many things, but most importantly, they are often used as a way of providing players with means of collecting a large portion of something that is typically annoying or arbitrary to grind for. The perfect example of this would be armor spheres or fuel for the steamworks, but a more important example is tough event quests being released to help with HR and MR grinding. If you're unsure what I'm talking about, Monster Hunter generally has a HR that raises as the player passes through tiers of key quests. After reaching the highest tier and defeating either the high rank or G rank final encounter, this rank generally unlocks and can be raised up to a maximum of 999 through the collection of HR points. World does something similar, however they differentiate Hunter rank and the new Master rank since Hunter rank can be unlocked within base world. I don't know how many people share this opinion, but I often find Monster Hunter as a whole at its worst when it comes to HR grinding. Generally your rank will simply lock you out of a few end game super quests, ones that expect you to be well prepared for them and thus set a rank that requires you to grind for a long period of time in order to raise it. The logic there is sound. If I'm a low rank, I probably don't have access to the best gear possible, and I'm probably not optimized for those more difficult hunts. If I raise my rank through grinding, I'll naturally earn more materials and gain personal gameplay experience that might help me later on. Generally speaking, you can have the gear necessary to clear a hunt long before you reach the HR threshold required to run it, meaning unless you're actively grinding for some other set or equipment, you're going to be playing Monster Hunter not for its core gameplay loop of hunting and crafting, but simply to raise an arbitrary number higher over and over. Over. This has been an issue since the very first entry in the series. It's not like World is the first to introduce and utilize this, but it is potentially the first to be so egregious about it. HR and MR lock the player behind so much endgame content it borders on the absurd, to the point that it seems they tried to rectify this by giving Alatreon and Fatalis low master rank requirements, yet made them fights that lean towards sets that are made through materials you can only find after MR100. It's not necessary to use this endgame game equipment, but it is incredibly beneficial. I, for example, first cleared Fatalis with an endgame set upon release fairly early. More recently, I ran the hunt with non-augmented gear and anything I could get around the MR24 threshold, and it was a much more daunting and trying experience. It took me an exceptional amount of time and learning to complete the hunt that wouldn't have been necessary if I was further within my master rank and the guiding lands which I ultimately didn't utilize. In fact, a lot of people had an issue with the release of Fatalis and Alatreon due to this low MR cap. A lot of players would be able to participate in this hunt who simply would just not be prepared for it due to the limitations of what is available to them. It's partially a skill issue and a game issue. Players can complete it at MR24, but the amount of work that needs to go into doing this is significantly higher for an MR24 player over an MR100 player. I didn't even have a full perspective on this mindset until I repeated the hunt later on. Twitter was seriously in an uproar over the MR24 requirement, and something that I initially felt as a gatekeepy knee-jerk reaction has more merit than I originally realized. So there's a little bit of egg on my face for that one. You got me there. If you want to run this with randoms, you have a better chance of having a bad time because there's most likely going to be more unprepared players than those ready for the hunt. So Master Rank and Hunter Rank are simply poorly utilized overall within the series, but this is especially shown in World and Iceborne where huge swaths of mechanics needed to better handle endgame content are locked behind these truly massive grinds to raise your rank. Going from MR24 to 100 takes an exceptionally long amount of time, and while you can optimize it through events and guiding lands, it's not a particularly fun or engaging thing to participate in. Realistically, MR should either raise faster or the requirements for certain hunts should be reworked to be available early so that more people are prepared for these hunts. Then you can raise the MR requirements for fights like Fatalis and Alatreon, since it's easier to get to and more players will be ready for it. It's not just a skill issue, you don't need to arbitrarily raise the playtime of your game by making me watch a bar fill up 100 times. One of the things that helped define World from its predecessors are the changes to combat. If World is to be praised for anything, it has to be the overall boost in cinematography showcased through the updated battle mechanics and what the player is able to do at any given time. For one, weapons have been given new abilities and mechanics, some reworked significantly. This happens in both World and Iceborne. Longsword gets foresight in base World, for example, and then later gets special sheath in Iceborne. Hunting Horn gets updates to recitals and encores, plus the new echo attack within the expansion. There's 
there's a lot of changes and I'm not going to delve into all of them. Outside of a few fights, I think it's an objective truth that World and Rise are, for the majority of the game time, easier overall experiences in comparison to older games. This is due to natural limitations within the older games, but it's also due to design choices and direction. When you update the abilities of the hunter but don't in turn update the abilities of the monster to keep the playing field even, you run into issues where the options the player has at their disposal allows them to walk all over the monsters within the game. A perfect example of this is the Wirebug in Rise. The amount of maneuverability and powerful options the Wirebug bestows upon the player allows them to run circles around most of the monsters within that entry. It's the same in World, all of the new abilities allow you to heavily bully most of if not all of the monsters that you've been hunting. And this is coming from somebody that most recently completed the game using Hunting Horn so you can save the long sword comments for another video. While there is still a learning curve and it is gratifying to get to the point where you can defeat said monsters with ease, the path there is relatively short. It's not until the end of Iceborne that you start to run into more truly difficult content. Fights like Raging Brachydeos and Furious Rajang are great examples of this. They have new abilities, they're faster, they're aggressive, they are a counter to the new abilities that the hunter has within their arsenal. Fatalis, one of the most boring fights in the series for almost the entirety of its existence, had a rework that turned it into both a difficult and engaging encounter. I threw myself at this fight for hours upon hours, but I enjoyed every minute of it because it felt like the pinnacle of what Monster Hunter strives to be. An uphill battle for hunters versus monsters that you can overcome through persistence, learning, grinding, and skill. There is a good chance that the developers were aware of these balance issues. They introduced a mechanic that looked to raise the difficulty artificially through a concept known as tempering, where the attack of monsters was simply higher. It's, in my opinion, one of the worst ways you could choose to increase the challenge of a hunt within the series. From my understanding, the arc-tempered mechanic for Elder Dragons actually added in additional features to the fight, but tempering left so much to be desired it was painful to see. Things like this were often sectioned off into event quests as filler content, not into the main progression system of the endgame. I'm not opposed to higher maneuverability in the series, I definitely prefer the more boots to the ground approach, which we had previously, but if players were interested in exploring these new, faster concepts, I'd appreciate if the monsters kept up with us. It's a weird thing through development, it can lead to a natural increase of power creep, as players come to expect more and grander features from their hunter, so too do we need to see more challenging features appear from the monsters we're hunting. We can look back at Frontier and see something like this taking place. Hunters and monsters increased in ability to exceptional values. While I feel all of this is somewhat detrimental to the overall design of the game in a sense, I feel it could be more gratifying overall. I also don't think this will be a big deal for players coming into the series for the first time who don't have a frame of reference. Realistically, the gameplay is still engaging. The environments, mechanics, and monsters can still lead to breathtaking encounters. Ones that you can go and tell your friends about. Ones that create good memories when playing with others. Monster Hunter is still a powerhouse and delivers this feeling, even if it did it slightly better previously. And the cinematography and setting of World does offer something that the previous games were unable to due to their limited design aesthetic. Mounting has also changed slightly from Generation 4, but pretty much exclusively for the better. It's a more engaging experience through allowing the hunter to jump around the monster so that they can attack other areas, and successful mounts aren't just met with a topple but a finisher move as well, which can be exceptionally good depending on your weapon type. Impact finishers on the head or slicing finishers on the tail can help push those park break thresholds to where you need them to be or cause knockdowns or knockouts. Movement has been updated as well. Players can run up walls, slide down slopes, perform new moves while sliding or in the air. There's plenty of new things to do in World. I mentioned previously that the use of certain recurring mechanics and the addition of new mechanics were added to help fit within the openness of World's areas. Players, for example, can now fast travel through various camps within each map, and they can even restock at these camps to the point that you can completely refill your inventory if you have enough stock. Certain items have been changed significantly as well. Paintballs are gone, whetstones are infinite, you don't need pickaxes or bug nets anymore. Everything is available to you from the get-go, and there's a significantly smaller need to prepare for a hunt before going out on it. At least until the end game content, and that's obviously for the worse. Monster Hunter is best known for its monsters, but what really hooks you in is how you learn to overcome them and learn to prepare and bring the necessary materials in order to do that. This isn't the case anymore. You no longer need to prepare for a hunt because if you faint, you just get sent back to the camp and can completely restock your inventory. Need more bombs? You got them. More healing potions? Sure. 
There's less incentive to learn a fight properly and get better at mitigating damage because you're realistically never going to run out of healing items if you don't want to. Your only true enemy in the hunt is the timer itself. Camps were probably a necessity in terms of traveling around the overly large maps, but the ability to restock shouldn't have been implemented and fights should have been designed in a way that expected you to not utilize said mechanic. Realistically, most fights in base world and Iceborne aren't going to require this while others seem to expect you may need it. Fatalis is a good example of this. Sure, some players can solo him in under 10 minutes, but chances are you're going to faint a couple of times. He just deals that much damage and one slip up can lead to a cascade of issues. If Fatalis's timer wasn't set to 30 minutes, or if he had a slightly lower HP pool, there'd be less chance of you utilizing the camp while still offering a difficult fight overall. You can still complete it how it is now, but you probably expect to see the camp at least once or twice. That seems to ruin the spirit of the hunt in my eyes. Preparation has always been a huge factor in those final ranks of Monster Hunter, and to see it basically thrown out the window thanks to the camps is rough to say the least. Still, a lot of these considered quality of life achievements aren't as egregious as things like the camp. Being able to have a radial menu shortcut is a key factor that makes item management much easier. The player now has more control over their UI. Songs for the hunting horn can be listed on the screen for them or turned off completely. There's a lot of progressive design decisions that were made to convey more information to the player while not taking away from the core experience. Not damage numbers though. Those can go right back into the trash. Sorry guys. In previous retrospectives, I broke up the progression of the game into each major rank from low to G, and I was planning on doing something similar here, but with how long the script has become and with how a lot of similar talking points have already been brought up, I'd rather focus on monsters as a whole, followed by specific key fights that help showcase the design direction of World and Iceborne. One of the greatest parts about 5th generation is the upgrade returning monsters gain moving from an old generation to new. Monsters like Rathalos and Diablos now have more detail than we've ever seen. They, in a sense, feel more real within the environments than was previously possible, and that's an amazing experience for returning players. The first time I ever played World, I was more excited to see returning monsters over the new additions, and that has to do with me being curious towards their changes, and also feeling fairly underwhelmed with a lot of what World offered overall in terms of new hunts. That being said, the new roster wasn't bad by any means. Monsters like Odegaran really shined for me. I like the flesh gore design, and I loved its armor set. I love how fast and aggressive they could be. I love mechanics like Tsitsiyaku's Konal Flash, or breaking all of the bones off of Radabon. The design of Al Hazak was both terrifying and intriguing. It helped fill a bit of a void for losing Kezu and Giganox, you know, for another entry. Basil was a perfect substitute for Devil Joe, although maybe not quite as terrifying. Many of the world designs did what they wanted to and they did them well. While their designs may have come off as fairly basic within the early portions of the game, the same could be said for the majority of entries in the series. Here we're fighting Jagras and Kuliaku early on. In Generation 3, we were fighting Jaggies and Kuropeko. I feel the latter exuded a little more personality overall, but these were all very basic and simplistic fights. Nergagante specifically has to be one of the high points of world overall. The storyline surrounding Nergagante is fairly ridiculous. The hunters find out that the other dragon is a key factor in keeping the ecosystem in balance, but they still need to hunt and kill it due to what I can only assume slash remember has to do with Xenojiva. But regardless of how Nergagante is presented in the narrative, it has one of the most satisfying fights overall, especially for a flagship. It's a very aggressive and intimidating monster, but the telegraphs of it are done very well. Large buildups followed by attacks that allow you to clearly see where the safe zones are. Think of him shooting out his wings on either side as an example. Additionally, similar to Radabon, the player can actively break the spikes around the body. He even punishes the player for getting up too early after a knockdown. If the player instead stays down after getting hit by him, they can dodge a follow-up slam attack from him with no input at all. There's a lot of very rewarding intricacies to the Nergagante fight. On the opposite end of the spectrum, you have fights like Zora Magdaros. You can think of Zora as World's attempt at reviving similar fights found in Generation 3 and 4 with Gen Moran and Darren Moran, respectively. Unfortunately for the player, Zora ends up not living up to either of these. The fights are simple enough. Players spend some time on the ground using tools like cannons to deal damage to the giant Elder Dragon, and then also spend time on the monster itself, mining, running around, and dealing damage. So what's the major difference, and what causes Zora to fail where Gen succeeded? The main issue is how slow-paced and on rails the fight ends up feeling. The nice thing about the Gen Moran fight is that you are free to do pretty much whatever you want during it. You can be on the ship and shooting cannons or using the gong and ballista binder to prevent attacks, and then you have the option to jump onto the monster in real time in order to scale it and break the weak parts on its back. 
Jen is hyper cinematic in the attacks it chooses to use. It dives into the sand and jumps over your ship like a giant whale. It charges head first at you and can only be stopped by the Dragonator. It has two tusks that you can not only walk on but break as well. It leads into a final showdown where you and your party have to push Jen back as long as possible until it's repelled or slain. Proof of a hero pops off at the perfect time and the sense of scale when Jen rears up and you hit the gong to knock it down is fantastic. It's breathtaking. Meanwhile, Zora Magdaros walked for a very long period of time, and that's about it. It walks, and it walks, and it walks. And while it's walking, you're climbing the large cliffs along its back to find key magma cores that you're expected to destroy. Once you've done that, there's nothing else really to do. You can mine, or wait for Nergigante to show up, but you were stuck on Zora until the final phase of that fight. It's a glorified walking simulator and you're not even the one doing the walking. Nergigante slightly makes up for it by appearing as an added target for a temporary period of time, but you don't really need to interact with him at all in order to be successful. The final phase of the fight is at least somewhat satisfying, with plenty of cannons being filled for you constantly by various NPCs, meaning you have plenty of satisfying moments where you launch five cannonballs at a time towards the giant monster. For a monster to be built up so heavily by the narrative, only to be such a snooze fest, and then you have to hunt it twice, it's almost an insulting experience that looks to say, hey, look what we can do with all this technology, rather than how can we make this fight as fun as possible. So you think to yourself, okay, Zora was bad, but the real final boss is going to be great, right? Oh, my sweet summer child, no. You idiot. You utter buffoon. Why would you think something like that? Why would you be so optimistic after the absolute failure that Zora Magdaros was? Xenojiva is by far one of the worst storyline endgame bosses to be released within the series. Not only is the fight less engaging than Nergigante, the monster is so large and slim that you often have a hard time as a blade master hitting various parts of his body for weak points or to get specific breaks. The fight overall is not only incredibly easy, but just a mess and you'll more often often see yourself running up to its claw than anything else in the fight. Terrible. I was blown away with how poor of an encounter this ended up being. It was awful. I feel like Iceborne remedies some of these encounters in a better way. You get multiple encounters with Valkana, for example, one of them being a short siege that doesn't last too long, but is engaging enough to be enjoyable. And the final fight against Valkana is nearly as fun as Nergagante was in the base game. Shara Ishvalda as well is a much more interesting multi-phase final boss, starting as a rock golem and then transitioning into its true form. The ability to use the environment against it, the need to navigate all of the quicksand puddles it creates, and finally the mad rush towards the edges of the map as it throws out its super ability. Iceborne really started to get things right. Not subspecies though. Every subspecies in that game was absolutely torture. Mostly looking at Viper Toby Kodachi here. And the post-game content was just fantastic in terms of monsters introduced because this is where we really started to see real difficulty that made you consider preparing beforehand you know, before going out on a hunt. Raging Brachidios was not only reintroduced, but reworked to have multiple phases of its own, with a final encounter within the Elder's Recess area of the Guiding Lands that is such a mess of mechanics, but in a way where you feel like you're watching a fireworks show. It's also technically the easiest phase of the entire fight, so you really just get to enjoy yourself during it, where Jang marked its return and was hyper-aggressive. Players really had to be on their toes with that one because the monkey could steamroll you. And if you weren't careful and weren't planning ahead, then you had Furious Rajang, which not only had the same aggression, but new moves and mechanics you had to watch out for. His laser beams and projectiles would explode around you in a way that looked like glass exploding off of the ice. These fights were incredibly memorable and rewarding. The Furious Rajang Hunting Horn was one of my favorites in the game, and the Light Break Longsword from Raging Bracky was also one of my favorite weapon designs. I've talked about the reintroduction of Alatreon. He's one of my favorite monsters from Generation 3, and the armor design is also one of my all-time favorites that I believe I'm still using as layered armor on my longsword save file. I and many others enjoy the Alatreon fight from Monster Hunter Tri and 3 Ultimate, but it definitely has its downsides. I found a lot of the fight mechanically boring, and found certain things like knocking it into a wall too difficult to get to actually work. In Iceborne, it feels like each elemental style of Alatreon has its own personality. When he uses specific elements, you feel like you are in a different fight entirely. There's a lot of flavor to it, and a lot of satisfaction in learning and dodging the various mechanics. The obvious downside to the fight is Eschaton Judgment. Monster 
Hunter has always had elemental requirements for some things in some capacity. For example, Blangonga Fangs required fire damage in order to break them, but this is potentially the first time that we've ever had such a strict requirement on using elemental weapons that would counter Alatreon's super move that is both undodgeable and mechanically obtuse. Monster Hunter isn't an MMO. It's not a game where you necessarily have a designated healer or an easy means of healing over time necessarily. So when you are met with an unavoidable attack, one that will kill you unless you heal throughout it, even if you dealt enough elemental damage, it's mechanically confusing to the player in terms of making sure they keep their HP up throughout it. And this mechanical requirement as a whole seems to promote going back to the camp so that you can switch equipment. A mechanic that in my opinion shouldn't even be a factor in hunts seems to require utilization here. Monster Hunter sprinkles in little mechanics like this throughout. Safi Jiva has a room-wide AoE that you need to dodge by hiding behind rocks. Alatreon has Eschaton Judgment. Behemoth gets a pass since it's an event quest. World and Iceborne often tried to be something they were not. They weren't an MMO. They were a solo co-op action RPG, and some of these mechanics aren't able to be implemented easily in a way that syncs with this game style. Now I've talked about tempered monsters as a mechanic already. I've also talked about researching and picking up tracks. One thing I feel I left out, however, is just how bad tempered elders were at the start of World. This was ultimately a non-issue with the release of Iceborne, but before that, players that reached HR 50 could finally take part in hunting a tempered elder dragon, specifically Kirin. It was potentially one of the most annoying fights at the time because not only was it a wall locking you out of content, but he could also essentially one shot or two shot you regardless of your set. Additionally, Kirin was pretty much the only tempered elder dragon you would run into naturally, so you needed to spend a fair portion of that hunt following the Kirin and picking up tracks so that you could unlock at least one other tempered elder investigation. Otherwise, you may find yourself out of luck in terms of ever finding tempered elders unless you checked for online quests posted by other players. If I dislike tempering so much, why would this matter to me? As I mentioned previously, tempered elders were, at the time, required to augment some equipment, meaning if you didn't have steady access to them, you'd have a harder time grinding for your augments overall. Also, I feel obligated to mention that they ruined Lunastra, and I will not elaborate further. If you know, you know. If you don't, lucky you. We've already addressed open areas versus the previous entry's use of zones. It is one of the key decisions that transforms Monster Hunter into what it is today. Instead of revisiting those points, I'd like to talk about the overall design of the areas themselves. To praise the areas, I'd like to first say that the level of detail is simply fantastic. I don't know if you've ever tried this, but if you own it, try playing GTA 5 in first person mode on a next gen console or PC. Just walk around the city. The level of detail and the density of objects and pedestrians truly makes the city feel alive, and I think the development team managed to create something similar with the areas in Monster Hunter World. Every area is rife with endemic life, Linnean creatures, small monsters running around and actively interacting with the environment. There's even NPCs out there from time to time that may have some side objective for you in terms of research. The areas have all these little nooks and crannies that you can find and explore that can lead to rare endemic life, to the Grimmelkine, or to rare gathering nodes. So in that capacity, these areas were a huge success. Many of them I really appreciate. Wildspire Wastes is fantastic. The Coral Highlands can be confusing in some spots, but overall very fun to explore, with a lot of verticality. All of these maps have plenty of ways to interact with the environment as well. Elder's Recess has these large crystals that can be shot down with slinger ammo, leading to high damage and a topple if they connect with a monster. The world of Monster Hunter World feels alive, and that's exactly what the developers wanted to convey to the player. It was a huge success in this way. Well, mostly. Some of the maps, in particular Ancient Forests, suffer from something we've discussed already, trying to go for too much for what you already have. The Ancient Forest, in particular, is an absolutely horrendous maze of winding paths and poor map design that makes it difficult to tell whether you need to traverse vertically or horizontally. The map in World is not particularly good at conveying depth and layers based on where you are, and I often, to this day, find that I struggle the most traversing through the Ancient Forest over any other map in the series. And this is the introductory map, no less. In my previous opinion piece of world, a few individuals tried to say that learning the map was part of the preparation process, and that you're simply expected to get good at traversing it. And no, I disagree with this. The ancient forest is simply poorly designed. 
every other map in the game is at least somewhat manageable in terms of getting from point A to point B, but the same cannot be said for the forest, and in a game that gives you both a mini map and a normal map that end up being effectively useless in one area, you have to just cut your losses here and admit that the location could benefit from a rework of some kind. Just make it more clear how to get through to specific areas or fix the map system in general. There's one final area to touch on, however, and one I'd like to use as the endpoint of this retrospective. One that isn't necessarily poorly designed map-wise, but the included functionality and need to utilize it lessens the overall experience of Iceborne's endgame. It should be obvious, but I'm of course talking about the Guiding Lands, aka the Grinding Lands. The Guiding Lands are unlocked after defeating Shara Ishvalda and are used for a variety of reasons. First, mechanically, the Guiding Lands are broken up into multiple recreations of the areas you've previously visited through the main game. They've all been fused together so that you could travel between biomes freely within a single map. And each of these biomes have levels that can be raised or lowered up to seven. By raising one area, you may be lowering another, and to raise said areas, you need to hunt and gather. And you end up doing this a lot, a whole lot against monsters you may not necessarily care about hunting. You need to hunt monsters to raise small gauges that will allow you to find more tracks to hunt more monsters, and these monsters in turn do not drop their normal materials, but Guiding Lance specific materials that are used for things like Iceborne's augmenting system. Then you need to level up your areas so that said areas will introduce new monsters so that you can hunt those monsters and repeat the process over and over again. And the amount of time it takes you to raise these levels is absolutely insane and only after an update did they let you properly lock in the level of various biomes so that you didn't need to lose levels in one to gain in another. That's not all. If you want to gather there, good luck actually finding the gathering nodes as they do not appear on the map and they blend in with the walls and cliff sides of various areas more so than any other actual map in the game. And gathering isn't as simple as finding the node. You also need to continue gathering to raise the level of your nodes in the area you are trying to raise the overall level of. So you're raising the levels of tracks to unlock lock more monsters, then raising the level of gathering nodes, and also raising the level of the biomes themselves. Grind after grind after grind. Not for normal materials, but so you can simply augment the equipment you already have. It's too much and it's not worth it. The guiding lands are the perfect, or rather the ultimate example of adding in an unnecessary grind to a game that already has grinding built into its core game loop. Who could blame players for not wanting to take part? But here's the thing, guiding lands are also one of the main ways to efficiently raise your master rank as well. You're effectively forced to this awful map where you are then forced to work and work and work to toil away for hours upon hours so that you can eventually take part in the good content again. But the good content is unlocked at master rank 24 and doesn't even require this area to finish it. The most insulting part of this chore of an area is that you have to use it if you want to unlock monsters like Brute Tigrex or the Metal Wraths. Yangaruga is also introduced here, and it's cool to note that Iceborne is where they finally classify the Scarred Yangaruga as a variant. Honestly, I'm not sure what I would do to fix the Guiding Lands outside of removing it completely. Maybe making augmenting possible through some other means and make leveling the tiers of individual areas be through optional quests. If you want to raise the Recess Zone to level 2, do this Dodogama quest. If you want to raise it to level 7, fight this Brute Tigrex. Or something similar to that, it's kind of like Deviance clear progression through assignments and quests that the player can choose to challenge themselves with, rather than mindless grinding and forcing me to stay in the area as long as possible. You get more after each completion, with a clear end after 5-6 to six hunts per zone, and within these hunts are new monsters you haven't fought in this entry yet to make it more desirable. Good, you're here. <laughs> Hope you're ready. In my original opinion piece for World and Iceborne, I question whether you could even consider them to be Monster Hunter games at all. We have plenty of Monster Hunter style games out there, games like God Eater or Tokaiden. Apparently it's not pronounced Tokaiden. I don't even remember how to pronounce it while I'm recording this and I'm not going to look it up. World was, in my opinion, more of its own separate entity within the genre that Monster Hunter created. Rather than a core Monster Hunter experience we have come to expect, I don't think that was necessarily 
an accurate conclusion. Poor Monster Hunter mechanics are clearly there after all, and while the direction of the series has shifted severely thanks to the decision to make areas open, aesthetically, World is very similar to very early entries in the series like Monster Hunter 1 in the Freedom series. Rise tried to reinvigorate some of the old design aesthetic, and I think it's on the right path, at least somewhat, but both entries in Generation 5 still build off of an open environment concept, and that is one of the strongest influencers in terms of what the mechanics of Monster Hunter are going to be like. The change in mechanical design from the areas, to the items, to the weapons, all the way to the monsters themselves have led me to better differentiate World from the rest of the series. It's simply too mechanically different to be considered old school Monster Hunter, and I believe something similar happened when Generation 3 released, although not to such a drastic degree. That all being said, Monster Hunter World and Iceborne find their own way to hold their own in comparison to previous entries in the series. There's still that sprinkle of difficult content and necessary preparation for it in order to be successful, and while the narrative was rather lackluster, the same could be said about previous entries as well. I look forward to seeing what the sixth generation of Monster Hunter will bring. Will cutscenes be skippable? Will I be forced to interact with online design concepts even when playing solo? Will I, as a hunter, be even stronger in the future, or will they dial it back somewhat to prevent power creep? Will monsters become stronger, faster, and with new abilities in order to better keep up with the progression of hunters overall? There's a lot of questions with no real answers as of yet. Monster Hunter has the ability to release some great content, and while the low points are very low, borderline detrimental to the overall experience, World and Iceborne still triumph in the fact that they are good games, potentially great games even. Regardless of if they're my personal favorites within the series, Monster Hunter World is a great Monster Hunter game. Hey, if you enjoyed this video, again, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing. Every little bit helps. Additionally, I stream regularly on Twitch where we are currently playing through Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate with Alchemy Sword and Shield. Yeah. If you'd like to join the community, we have a Discord as well. You can find all the links in the description. Thanks so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you in the next video. Hey, you made it to the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching. Welcome to the Patreon section where I'm going to shout out everybody that is supporting the channel. If you're in the high tier, your name should be here. It's usually it's usually there. And if you're in the G rank tier, I'm going to your name's still here and I'm going to shout you out vocally. How cool is that? That's amazing. You too can be shouted out vocally by me on a video how that's so nice so nice of me to do that and so nice of you to support me so thank you so much for that cheap seats cody thank you so much for the g-rank tier triton 8 thank you so much for the g-rank tier i really appreciate it festive and snow cart thank you for the g-rank tier guys really appreciate it prime xd thanks so much for the g-rank tier the tim pie thank you for the g-rank tier Ashton Price and Disparity, thank you so much for the G-Rank tier, appreciate it. Joyce Sanders and Beyond the Time, thank you so much for the G-Rank tier, I appreciate it. Christopher and Nolan Brookman, thank you so much for the G-Rank tier. Carl the Crab and Mo Al Kasemi, thank you for the G-Rank tier, always appreciated. You guys have been going hard, going hard on it, thank you so much. Same to Cyberworm, Kathleen Medjuk, and Crunchy Kauru, thank you so much for the G-Rank tier, guys. Jonathan and Strange Lee, thank you for the G-Rank tier. And Rosalio and Mr. Janky, my longest patrons, thank you so much for the G-Rank tier, guys. Really appreciate it. Hope you uh, hope you enjoy the content. And thank you for supporting me, everybody. And I will see you in the next video.